Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Dentist Show Live. It's Thursday night, and of course, it's date night with Denta, and we bring you nothing but engaging topics, inspiring topics, and you know, topics that will get you thinking. You know, during this COVID 19, it's a time for us to be thinking about Africa. Okay, and tonight's show. We are going to be looking at investing in Ghana 101. We're going to be looking at stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and everything in between. And, you know, what are the opportunities for us in the diaspora to invest back home in Ghana? Um, and not only that, today we're going to be looking at um, investment opportunities in the UK for Ghanaians and Africans who want to be part of an exciting venture, which is, in, you know, championed by the Ghana Union, Emmanuel Quazen, um, which basically, you know, what he's looking at is for Ghanaians to own their own venue in the UK. As you know, we have so many funerals, so many parties, weddings, etc. How do we invest in a venue that is owned by us, you know, run by us, uh, to make sure that it becomes a business venture where we all can make money. Um, and so it's, you know, it's going to be very exciting on how you can put your money in there and see how best, you know, you can turn around some money during this COVID-19. I mean, he's raised a substantial amount of money and um, he's looking for more to conclude it within the next two months. Um, I must say a big thank you, as always, to World Remit for sponsoring um, the show. It's a better way um, to send money abroad. If you haven't downloaded your app, make sure that you go online, download your app, go on their website, and send money back home to a loved one. It's very simple, very easy, and um, it's the rate is the best, actually. Um, so make sure that you, you, know, you go online and and subscribe to tap tap to oh my god to world remit um and then i must say a big thank you to seek so seek is um an um, a headphone that is made by a Ghanaian. um i have one here i'll show you in a second but if you look on the screen her name is mary spio now, if you're somebody that loves headphones, loves to listen to music, you know, this is the chance for you to go online and pick up one. Basically, you can buy a headphone now at www.seekvr.com. All you have to do is use a promo code DENTARVIP and all the buyers get 10% discount. Yes, 10% discount um, online. So go online, purchase one. Let me know what you think. Um, of the products, you will definitely be thanking me later. Um, let me just show you. I've got one here. It's so comfortable. It has a uh, microphone as well that you can attach to it. Um, it's here. So it's really, really easy to use and it's fantastic. If you like to listen to your songs while in the gym and you like to hear the bass and all the beat, then you need to make sure that you go online and get one of these. Um, and again, you know, with, with, um, with what we're doing, we're always, always supporting the community. And I think that, you know, there's some amazing young women that are doing amazing things. So this all-purpose seasoning is made by Guyan. She's based in Atlanta. Um, and she's got all-purpose seasoning. She's got um, shito, um, shito, pepper sauce, you name it. And the best one that I like is the jollof seasoning. For all those people that love jollof, make sure that you go online and grab one. It's really, really important that we support our own and get that going. And then we also have Esther London Beauty, her lip glaze, as she calls it. Make sure that you go online as well and purchase one for a loved one, for a friend, whatever birthday, grab one. Yep. Okay, so now let me come to my guests. Um, as I mentioned to you, I've got you know phenomenal people on the panel today. Um, and it's going to be a really, really good conversation. Hello, Martha. Hello, Khadija. Um, hello, Nana Ventures. Where's everybody watching me from? Please let me know. Um, I've already got a question come from Keith Williams. Can non-citizens invest in stocks and bonds in Ghana? We are going to be answering all of those questions in tonight's conversation. So don't you worry at all. Um, so I think I'll start with, you know, my UK people first, because, you know, um, 
you know, living in the UK and coming to, to Ghana, I'm actually in Ghana at the moment. Um, but what I think that the Ghana Union and the chairman of Ghana Union is doing is absolutely phenomenal. And uh, please welcome Emmanuel Poison onto the show. Hi, Emmanuel. Oh, hi. Hi, Denta. Good evening. How are you? I'm very well. Uh, the, line, the, the line is playing up, but I'm, I'm very well. <laughs> And, and oh, how are you? Be playing up. I'm I know. I'm good. I'm good. So we need your full attention, full focus, everything. The line can't be disappearing on us. I hope you can hear me, though. I can perfectly well. Perfectly well. So, oh, Ima, oh, I just want to um, first of all introduce yourself. Tell us a bit about yourself and what you do. How long you've been the chairman for Ghana Union, um, and then we'll delve into the investment opportunities for our viewers. Okay, thank you, uh, Denta, for, for this great show. You've been doing an amazing job. Um, the community has uh, enjoyed a lot of great topics that you have shown in the recent past, uh, and, and I'm sure you have much more to come. And thank you all to all the viewers who have uh, been very loyal and been watching. We want you to keep watching and extending it to others so that we can be a better place one day. Uh, as, a, mm -hmm. as, a, as a whole, Ghanaians and the Ghanaian community, wherever we are, uh, we need voices like yourself. I am Emmanuel Kwesi Kwesin, and I'm the chairman of Ghana Union in UK and Ireland. Uh, I've been the chairman since 2013, uh, uh, obviously helping, supporting, advocating for Ghanaians, uh, uh, you know, liaising on Ghanaians' behalf on matters of national interest, uh, be it Ghana or UK. Uh, and, and we have done so for the past, I would say, six to seven years. Uh, there is a, a few more left that we can give to our community, and that is why tonight is quite important to me, because obviously uh, we've come to an age where we have to do something about our future. If yeah. not our past, at least we should be looking at our future. I am an uh, account uh, of, of a personnel uh, management accountant by myself, uh, and I work in the Houses of Parliament in the UK. That is what I do for a living, but for the community, we all contribute on voluntary capacity uh, to bring good to Ghana, our motherland. Yeah, absolutely. And how many people are under, or how many organizations are under the Ghana Union um, brand? Okay, Ghana Union works in a way that uh, we focus on the groups. So we have Ghanaians who have come from Ghana, living in UK and around UK. And so you have all the ethnic community groups. Uh, so every group in Ghana, we have a replicate of the same group in UK. So you have the Nzema group, you have the Novia from the North Water region, you have the Dagaba Lanta from the Northern region, you have the Ga Adangbe, you have the Lakpe, you have you have Adakole, you have uh, Fantin Puntuku from Central Region, you have you have about I would say about fifty to hundred strong community groups. Uh, mm -hmm. Every single year, the community groups are growing. As I speak now, statistics tells me that we have about 210 Ghanaian groups in the UK, uh, which are all based on ethnic uh, lines. Uh, apart from the ethnic groups, we also have professional organizations who are affiliated to the union. So we have the Ghana Nurses Association, we have the Lawyers, and, uh, Lawyers Association, the Accountant, the Social Workers Association, and then you go into areas where, you know, there are ad hoc organizations, people who either met in a, a club and formed a group or people who met at a barber shop and, you know, became friends and then they form a group. So we have all these complex dynamics of Ghanaian organizations and they come together to form Ghana Union. So it has been in existence since 1979, uh, 40 years oh, wow. plus now. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, yes, our, our intentions and interest is to advocate for Ghanaians who otherwise have no one here in this country and people that uh, actually want to relate to a community that when there are situations, they can be supported or guided or, you know, advice or guidance that we can give either on behalf of Ghanaian government or Ghanaian, you know, as our country or on behalf of the UK government, be it information, uh, advocacy, uh, you know, 
just a normal day-to-day -day, uh, relationship that can help somebody to settle here and be okay. able to feel like they belong to a community. Okay, okay. And have you had instances where you've had to, you know, support maybe a particular group or individuals to help them stay in the, in the community in the UK? Have you ever faced any of those? We, we, we have come across many, countless of them. Some are immigration related, some are social related, some are welfare related. And when I talk of immigration, I'm sure it's quite obvious. Uh, people who have come here need to regularize themselves. They need to go through a lot of scenarios for yeah. them to be settled. And we work with a lot of Ghanaian lawyers. Some are, you know, some of them are very distinguished in their in their profession, and they do provide help with our, our compatriots. Uh, welfare matters. People who, by nature or by culture, have either gone off the hook and done something in their family life that has brought disrepute between their family and the uh, authorities here. Uh, in terms of social activities, people who have either come here and don't have no family and either become ill in hospital or being in prison or there's a, lo a whole lot of wow. a variety of issues and and these are issues that come on daily basis okay so what made you you know um the ghana union decide to have their own venue you know why do you think it's important for us um in the uk to have a venue of our own this is an important question because uh, as you know, uh, history tells us that we've been free from United Kingdom for well over nearly 64 years now. Um, and Ghanaians have been part of this community for such a long time. We have sat here and watched other communities who even joined the EU in 2010, i.e. the Polish community. They've come here, they've established themselves, they have uh, a place to call their own. It is true that we have a Ghana High Commission. It is true that the government of Ghana has premises, but they are not premises that can, can give us a place where when there is a need, we can all congregate in terms of uh, matters that we believe we need to come together. There are occasions where we go to High Commission and hold events, but uh, Highgate is the biggest premises of the High Commission, and you can't even take 500 people at a time because one... Uh, the locality where they live and the noise level and all the permissions that need to go around makes it very impossible. Uh, we Ghanaian community here, we are huge in numbers. I mean, statistics from 2005 uh, census in UK put Ghanaians here to almost a million, right? Uh, and we, we, we sit here and we go, we have all these social and other issues. We don't have any place called our home which simply means that any time we have to meet, either for independence celebration or for national purposes, uh, we have to end up renting a place or depend on the mercies of other nat you know, national countries who have made it. So this is not a new idea. It's been in the pipeline for so long. It's just that it hasn't been, we haven't managed to come to that point where we can all come together to do something for ourselves. And I have this view that yes the government or whichever government is in power yes you they may give you help but you need to help yourself as well uh, and at some point last year or two we came together as Ghanaian community organizations and then we decided that look it's about time we own our own place because venues in UK are very Can cost you. I hope you can hear me. Hello. It cut out a little bit, but we can hear you now. Right. Okay. Uh, I was saying that a hotel, renting a hotel that can accommodate about 300 seated capacity for an event, can cost you well over 5,000 pounds or 10,000 pounds, depending on the prestige of the premises you are using. Uh, even in common halls where school assembly halls and normal industrial estate halls are costing huge amount and all our groups have uh, a sense of belonging to ghana so every year they do dinner dances they do celebrations almost every weekend we have one funeral here one birthday party there one wedding anniversary there one uh, you know kind of you know birthday celebration somewhere 
And the question is, why why are we throwing all this money to our other sisters and brothers from other nationalities? You know, the Indians, the Pakistanis, the Turkish are all owning big, big premises. And we Ghanaians have become almost like we... Stupid internet. Hello. Okay, I can hear you now. I'm I'm really sorry, but I'm uh, the internet is frustrating me now. <laughs> I need to go to the UK. That, that that's the beauty of technology. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what what I was saying was, look, we've come to a point where we, as a community, in the mm -hmm. numbers that we are. And in the length of time that we, our forefathers and ourselves have been part of the generation of this country, we yeah. cannot sit on the fence and be okay with whatever we get. It's about time we have ourselves a place where we can call it a Ghanaian home. Uh, yes, the missions are diplomatic purposes. But when we have our own place where we can walk in, where we can teach our children our culture, where we can do other language classes or drama and dancing ensemble lessons for our children, the things that we were taught when we were back home in schools, we cannot bring it here because you know it's so expensive that most of the groups cannot afford. So the initiative now is, look, we need to come together. We need to be able to raise some money to buy a premises for ourselves and hopefully by doing so, we can do all those such good for the future generation, uh, if not to ourselves. I was saying, if not for ourselves now, for the future of our community. And that is the, that is the focus right now for the union. Okay, fantastic. I'm going to introduce the other panelists and we're going to dive into you know how people can invest. Um, I'm going to bring on my boss, my one and only boss. He knows who I'm talking, he knows I'm talking about him. He's always, you know, um, ready to go. He was, you know, on earlier on on the Guba uh, platform where we again we spoke about investment opportunities, and I'm so glad that you know he's given me another chance to interview him on the Dentist Show live as well. Um, he is the CEO of Ghana um, Investment Promotion, and I think he's been doing a fantastic job um, since he's come on there as a CEO. And for me, I really want to know, you know, there's going to be people in the UK that's going to stay in the UK um, that would you know, invest in the UK. Um, but there's other diasporans out there who want to know more about how they can invest in Ghana. So Emmanuel, I'm just going to take you off and bring on my boss. Um, so please welcome my boss, Mr. Yofi Grant. Hi, hi. Good evening, Denta. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. <laughs> I like your, your made in Ghana shirt. I like it. Oh, you do? Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. We, have, we have all these designs and patterns um, that are unique to Ghana that I think um, uh, adds to our culture. And of course, you know, culture is one of the biggest marketing tools you have for any country or any people. It's mm -hmm. their culture. So for me, it mm -hmm. just makes sense that at any opportunity, I can wave that culture up and, and, and put it in people's faces. Thank you so much. So for those, you know, people that are watching that don't know who GIP, um, GIPC, what GIPC does and, you know, and, you know, your role and what you do, can you just give us a little um, overview of that and then we'll, you know, I'll go into my next question. Okay, well, GIPC is the Ghana Investment Promotion Center. It's an office under the presidency, uh, office of the president. And our job is, uh, it is mainly to promote facilitate, attract foreign direct investment into Ghana um, because that is going to also be very useful in developing our economy. Um, secondly, we are also in assisting other agencies like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Trade and Industry into ensuring that uh, we have a vibrant investment and business climate in Ghana. So we work together with all these agencies. Um, to make sure we are engaged in serious reforms 
um, which will make Ghana um, the best place to do business in Africa in the medium term, um, but also to set Ghana as a hub for the West Africa region. But then the third bit will be that we, act, we actually advise the president and, and lobby for reform change and um, market condition, which enables the formulation of policy in my government. So basically, that's our, our main job. Um, but in the course of doing that, you, you realize that you end up doing a lot, a lot more other things. Um, yeah. You even vote internally, um, because there are Ghanaians who should also be investing in the economy. So you show them the opportunities, you help them get their businesses running. Then you also act, although we are mainly a promotion agency, we also um, have some regulatory responsibility ensuring that um, companies that come in that have um, contractual obligations to their head offices in, in, in wherever they come from, um, what we call a technology transfer agreement before they can repatriate money outside the country, outside the normal dividends and loans that they have to pay, etc. Et so uh, we do quite a bit of that. We also ensure that companies are in compliance with their registrations at the GIPC, um, and which enables us to give those that are uh, registered with the GIPC the incentives as prescribed in our law. You're, are you finding a lot of uh, people in the diaspora, um, Ghanaians or Africans, coming to invest in, in Ghana? Or do oh, you think yes. No, no, yes, there are. There are quite a number of Ghanaians who come every year to invest um, in, in our economy. Uh, and I, I guess because because they they are Ghanaian, um, they are able to transcend some of the cultural barriers in designing their products and services, and that makes it much more exciting for them than going to new markets where these things are difficult. But I mean, throughout our, our development, in fact, in the past twenty to thirty years, we've seen a significant you know impact by Ghanaians in the diaspora, and I can give one very typical example, like Data Bank which I must say, uh, at that time, when it started as an investment bank, was actually, um, Bloomberg was it is, actually said that Data Bank was ahead of its time. But uh, they actually sort of pioneered the asset management and investment banking uh, business or practice in Ghana. And today, it's, it's almost West African. So, so that was purely a, a diaspora and play. And if you look at other companies that have been set up, like Ashesi, a great university by my good friend Patrick, uh, Patrick Iwa. That's another diaspora play that has grown up to be um, a reputable institution. So you find them across, you know, uh, the, the economic divide. And you can even talk about Herman Chindu Hesse in the IT space, who you can also classify as a diaspora who set up his company, of Tribe, who are here. And there are so many of them, so many of them in that space. Um, uh, where we haven't seen too many though is in the manufacturing space, but I guess it's going to come. Um, it's going to come pretty soon, and so you, you, it's not like um, the diaspora has been left out of the uh, economic growth or the history of Ghana. The, the diaspora, on the contrary, is a magnificent force um, in our development. First of all, the apart from they sometimes bring in capital, physical capital, because. They work with have savings and they have access to finance. They come with um, what I would call intellectual capital, um, technical capital, um, best of practices in 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 in, in organizations, etc. And they come with cultural, you know, diversity um, because they go to school in other countries. They learn what others other countries bring. They bring all those to the market, and that that augurs well for us as a company that is offering services and goods to a global economy. Um, the more, actually, somebody just pointed out to me that in history, the countries that have had a lot of different uh, people contribute to their economies always um, see that it, it does well for their growth. And I can give examples. I mean, the Chinese, for example, had a lot of Chinese in school outside um, in many countries. And they learned um, they learned uh, the, what the economies were about, they learned the cultures, they learned the technologies, and they brought it back to China. I mean, the U.S. Mm -hmm. economy, uh, if you look at the U.S. economy and you look at some of the biggest players that have grown out of the U.S., they were migrants. They came from other countries. And, and so has the world been, right, from the days of Vasco da Gama to David Livingston to Amerigo Vespucci. It's always been across borders 
um, and an exchange of ideas, goods, and services. And so for us, um, we embrace the idea of the diaspora as a, as a critical link in, in national development. And we, we do look forward to more engagements in the future. Indeed, there's actually an office of the diaspora in the pre inside the presidency, at Jubilee yeah. House of the Presidency, uh, who I helped to formulate the policy um, direction and engagement with the diaspora. So it's, it's nothing new. Um, I just believe that now um, it's been elevated to a higher level of, um, of discourse and, of course, interaction and engagement. And I believe that it will all go well for our national development and cohesion. And, and how do you think that the COVID-19 has affected foreign direct investment into the country? Oh boy, uh, COVID-19 has affected everything, it's just not FDI. Um, and of course, you know, um, the advent of COVID-19, especially um, at the end of February going to March, um, when it became a global pandemic, um, there, was, there were two things that were immediately hit by COVID. One was lives and the other was livelihoods. Now lives, of course, because it's a disease and, and, and it was a disease that was actually killing people. Um, and so that became of paramount uh, concern um, that, that the world needed to do something. And once it became a global pandemic, then it wasn't a problem for one country, it was a problem for the world. The other problem was livelihoods. And this is a situation where the cure or finding a cure for the problem or a remedy for the problem of COVID-19 was just as bad as the disease itself. Because in ensuring livelihoods, then you had to take measures that were critical to save lives. For example, many countries shut their borders. Um, many businesses had to shut down because we had to social distance. We had to contain the spread of the virus. And so um, there, there were you know, lockdowns and um, curfews and you know, all sorts of new activities that governments had to enact to make sure that lives were saved. Um, and that affected livelihoods critically. Um, people who were earning could no more earn because they had to stop working, go home to be safe. Factories closed down, workplaces closed down, borders were closed down. So the, the, even the global supply chain was, was critically you know, disrupted. And China, which... Um, is a major player in global value chains and, uh, and um, supply chain, um, was one of the first countries to close its borders um, because of the disease, the outbreak in China. And you know, China exports significantly to a lot of countries. And for us, Ghana, China was one of our big um, trading partners. So once the borders were closed, goods couldn't come and go, it was a problem. But it's not just China. I mean, Europe, Americas, Asia, all the borders were closed. So can you imagine our ports sadly had to cease function, uh, airports had to cease function because there were no flights going. Available. There were no Please flights going. The internet and try again. Sorry. There were no flights going or coming. Um, and, and so, you know, that brought almost a standstill to the world in a very uncertain period. And even till, till now, uh, we are now realizing that a lot of those things we did whilst at the very beginning slowed down the infection rates and the disruption to lives and livelihoods. Um, going forward, because we don't have a cure, we don't have a remedy, we just have to contend with how to deal with this virus. Um, and, and that has led to what everybody now calls the new normal, where life has changed. Uh, you have to go out in the mask to make sure that you're not spreading or catching with face uh, shields. Uh, you have to socially distance. You have to ensure that you sanitize your hands, wash your hands as often as you can, carry with you a kind of sanitizer or whatever it may be to make sure that after you touch any surface or sick anybody or do whatever it is, you, you clearly sanitize your hands. So that in itself meant that a lot of business activities were curtailed and critically to that was finance. Many financing avenues were also disrupted. Um, and that was because due to lockdowns and due to the shutdown of industry and workplace and all that, many governments suddenly found themselves having to come up with rescue plans um, to help either their companies that could not pay their workers because they were shut down and the workers had to sit down. And if you're sitting down at home and the company is not paying you, that affects your life. 
I mean, it affects family life, it affects growth of the economy, it affects social life. So there was a lot of disruption in the financial supply chain in itself. Uh, many banks were caught in a situation where now um, they had to help countries come up with, you know, survival packages as well as packages to ensure that they could keep some of their industries still at work. And, and, and bear in mind, um, with the shutdown and the lockdowns, etc., there was a shutdown in production, but there was also a shutdown in consumption. And so many companies just stopped making money. In fact, many just went on a loss-making trajectory. Um, they were not working. They were not generating revenues. Um, so countries were not even getting the taxes they required because companies were not working. And all that affected the ability to invest or look at opportunities outside your confines. But the bigger problem with investments was the fact that um, with the advent of the, of the virus, global markets saw a severe erosion of value. Um, at, at some point, there was about $10 trillion of value totally wiped out um, from the markets. And this is money that could have been used to invest in other places. Whilst other country, while the state was looking at rescue packages, et cetera, for their businesses and for their lives. Uh, and so that in itself was a major difficulty for us. Investors couldn't come because their borders were closed. Some of the monies that they would have liked to invest, they now have to look inward into their countries to enable their companies to survive. Uh, and so foreign direct investment, as projected by Ongtad, the World Bank, is, was is expected to fall by some 40% and even more globally because of the pandemic. But um, I, I, interestingly enough, interestingly enough, for me personally, I think this is Africa's year. If I have said that uh, 2020 ushered in Africa's decade, and the simple reason is this: um, that Africa still commands a significant proportion of the world's mineral um, resources, which will be required to kickstart economies all over again. Um, should we have a control about, about COVID? That's one. Secondly. We, the continent itself, by 2020, would have one quarter of the world's population. That means that it has a significant proportion of the labor force uh, potential, as well as a significant market waiting to happen. Um, and if every fourth person you see is an African, uh, then you better be sure that, better believe it, that there's a market in Africa. Um, the current population of 1.2 billion is expected to go to about 2.5 uh, billion there. But beyond that, we are expecting a significant growth in the African market um, because of the um, Africa agreeing to set up the largest single market since the WTO, uh, which is the continental free trade area. And that in itself is a significant market waiting to happen globally. So Africa's situation is, is peculiar and interesting because we do seem to have all the chips that um, are essential for the world resetting, rebooting, and starting all over again. And by the way, Africa has over 60% of the world's remaining arable land left for farming. So the potential of Africa feeding the world is a real possibility uh, that creates opportunity for the continent and for investors outside. So with having the world's mineral resources, having the land, having the people, I think we have a great cocktail for success in the future. Absolutely, we certainly do. And I think, before, you know, before we actually really dive into that, I'm going to bring on our next guest, um, Mr. Akwesi Edu Wahine, who is um, head of Fidelity Securities Limited. Um, we're going to have a conversation with him, and I'm going to bring you back on, uh, Mr. Grant, just to have the conversation on investment. Sure. Thank you sure. so much. Okay. Hello. Hello. Hi, Hi. Hi. Good evening to your um, listeners and viewers. Yes, good evening. Thank you so much on the show today. Um, and, you know, I just want you to tell us a little bit about yourself and, you know, your role as head of Fidelity Securities Limited. What does that look like? Oh, okay. Hello. Good evening once again to everyone. I, I was initially trained as a mining engineer. But after my first degree, it was a passion to manage money. So I took up a second degree in finance and investment. Uh, that was in the UK. Came back to Ghana and joined Fidelity as a wealth advisor. 
uh, after about 14 years, I'm the head of the firm responsible for building wealth for both oh. individual institutional investors and also managing risk. As I build, I need to ensure that that wealth is sustainable. So generally for in individuals, we have products for them, what we normally call, I'm sure we'll discuss the, the mutual funds. So as little as 100 CDs can be invested in it. And then we invest across a lot of asset classes. There are others that look at both equity and then uh, fixed income. And there are also others that look at just fixed income securities. Let me also add that we are, um, we are owned by a very strong bank that plays a dominant role in the, in the financial markets. They're one of the leading players when it comes to trading and securities, especially fixed income securities as well. Let me add on the voluntary side, I do a bit of accounting and then financial manager support to a charity. So in short, I would say that I'm both an investment accounting and finance professional with 14 years of managing money and also wow. for helping charities. Oh, fantastic. But you know, um, why do you think it's important for the diaspora to start investing back home? Oh, okay. Let me just share, if you allow me, I, I read from, uh, there, was a, there was a survey by the Congo Secretariat uh, on, on the diaspora. Uh, it's uh, about 425 people. Mm -hmm. And it uh, was done between uh, March 2017 and then October 2018. And it said that 92% send money to your family and then friends. 55 make donations in kind. That's normally they send out a stereo, a sound system, clothing here and there. That's 55%. 33 give to uh, churches and then other religious institutions as well. And then interestingly, let's look at where they invest money. 16% of the survey own businesses in Ghana. 43 have accounts, one or two accounts with banks. Uh, and then also, interestingly, only about 8% invest in bonds. Which, which is a bit surprising. You're normally, if you look at the investment profile, you normally start with safe investment like bills, bonds, and then gradually build the muscle, and then you actually build businesses. But we see something that is a bit interesting here, that the others rather managing business in Ghana than investing in bonds and then other investment securities. And then the last one, the fact that 36 percent have no savings in Ghana at all. I think wow. it's important now because in our part of the world, you know, we are an emerging economy, there are growth opportunities all the time, and it's important that people come and then also enjoy part of that growth by investing and making returns. That's one side. The other side is that as they invest in our economy, this is what happens. Monies can be either given to the government, and the government can use it to build infrastructure. You come to Ghana, you see very good roads, you see good hospitals, and You've made money on the investment, and I see it. I can see the output. The other bit is once you also invest in an economy and invest in businesses, they get money to expand their operations, they employ more people, they can even also give back to society. So it's a win win situation for both uh, for the, diaspora, the people in the diaspora. They make money on their investment, that's one. And then also, the monies are channeled into the economy, and we can develop the economy. So that you always come back to Ghana and then you see a different Ghana. And then you can tell yourself mm -hmm. your money that is making that's making an impact. And then absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So and then also it gives no community. Oh, carry on, Percy. Yes, and also saying that the other thing is that uh, they may also have other areas they may want to invest, not just uh, make returns, but then socially as well. And then once they also invest, it can help build communities, you know. When it comes to emerging economies, there, there are big issues uh, helping in terms of poverty alleviation. So once you invest in Ghana, the other side is that we tend to build all these communities. And then at least uh, there's, there's less pressure on them to send us money all the time for us to spend as well. Because I remember in the survey, I read someone said that we don't think about it, we just give. Because culturally, we are used to helping. That's our nature. So once we have systems in place where we can deploy our money or our capital, then there's a better way to even help more than they are currently doing. Okay, thank you so much, um, Apusi. I'm gonna go and speak to Franklin and then I'll come back to you and we will dive into the conversation. I have loads of questions and I can see that my viewers are starting to put up questions <laughs> as well. Um, so we will come back to you in a few moments. 
Guys, I hope that you are enjoying the show so far. Please share your pages. You know, it's really important that, you know, as we are sharing knowledge, um, that we're not just impacting on you, but we are impacting on the few. Um, and so it's really important that you share your page, you know, like the page, subscribe to the page, um, and let us start a conversation about investing back home, the importance of it, what is a stock, what is a mutual fund, you know, how can you invest your you know, $1,000 to one million dollars let's think about investing back home and i think tonight's topic is going to be exceptional we have the right people on the platform to really encourage you and to advise you on the right way to invest back home um and so please if you're watching on facebook make sure you do, you do a watch party with somebody um as we dive into the conversation also what you can do it's about, you know, putting in your questions and we'll be going through that very shortly as well. Um, and, you know, if you're watching us on YouTube, subscribe and also, you know, share your page, you know, with YouTube, you can share it on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Please, please let's share it and let's get, you know, people to really, you know, have the conversation and, you know, learn a lot today about stocks, bonds and investing in Ghana. And so I have... You know, my last panelist, um, Franklin from Access Bank. Um, Access Bank is our partner uh, when it comes to the Guba Diaspora card. And um, it's been a very fruitful relationship that we have. Franklin is the country treasurer um, at Access Bank Ghana. Franklin, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you very much, Dentha, for having me. I'm sure you are you're enjoying the Guba, you know, obviously we've started this relationship um, together with Access Bank and, you know, it's been fantastic working with you guys. Um, but, you know, as the, the country uh, treasurer, that's that's a big title. I mean, that means all the money is, is, is on you. All the money comes to you, Franklin. <laughs> tell, us a bit about, tell us a bit about your role and what you do. Okay. I think my, my role as Access Bank country treasurer mm. is basically to manage the bank's balance sheets and the bank's liquidity. For me, I also handle the bank's risk when it comes to interest rates, risk, exchange rate risk. Okay. In Access Bank, the way we structured as a treasury, we also run the trading business of the bank. Basically, the trading involves trading in currencies, trading in bonds as well, and sometimes in some derivative instruments. I think for Access Bank, I'm sure your panelists would know, your other panelists and also your viewers would know something about Access Bank. Access Bank Ghana is part of Access Bank Group, which is a Pan African bank yeah. headquartered in Nigeria. Basically, we are currently in about seven countries in Africa Eastern, Southern Africa, West Africa. We also have some representation in the UK. We have a fully fledged bank in the UK, I'm sure. Yeah. Most of your panelists would have seen, and the audience would have seen a uh, bank somewhere in the in a small part of London. It's all yeah. this is a full fledged bank in London as well. For for us, we believe the the fact that we need to build strong African institutions, especially strong African financial institutions. Globally, and the history of the world has shown that for us to have a very strong development as a continent, we need that financial engine to work that's what we create the needed capital to build the infrastructure that we see to build the businessmen that you see and to fund them so for us our, our, our aim is not just in ghana is to is, is to have a pan-african movement where we can build capital across the continent and then best practices from where we see them moving Things around to ensure that at least we have we 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 have, we have the Africa that will be able to rival any other block in the world in terms of development. Where we've seen the, the Asian guys grow because they build strong financial institutions. So what we want to have and drive that that conversation and also drive drive that process in 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 in, our, in Africa. And I think that's what we seek to do in Access Bank. And, you know, frankly, you've had over 14 years um, experience across the banking industry in Africa. You've worked, you know, you're currently in Ghana. You've done Nigeria, Zambia. You know, how is it, um, you know, in Africa? You've had, you know, you've worked in other countries. Are Africans investing in Africa? 
for 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 my experience, what I've seen is it. I think for Africa, we 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 we, are, we I think we all came from the same the same chip. We came to the same block. We we have we have similarities, very 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 similar as individuals and as a group. Though we have some differences. Investment, I must say, across Africa is not that strong. Across the markets of web gene, we we have a, we have an issue around the saving culture, where we don't have enough savings to generate the capital to drive the, the economies of Africa. For Zambia, Southern Africa, Nigeria, for Zam for Southern Africa, if you take out South Africa, which I think is a more developed market, and they have managed to drive some level of savings because for for you to have a strong investment investment arm um, investment business in the country and drive capital creation you need to you need to have a very high savings rate what i've seen across africa is that we we are not there when it comes to savings mainly it, it has its social implications it also has its roots in our economic development where we don't have enough disposable income to save but i must say this that i've seen a movement based on my time in other african countries where you see a conscious effort by individual Africans to begin to save. So you, 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 you we, 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 we can track it in the last 10 years to see that saving streets has picked up very, very fast, but we're still lagging behind the developed world. But I think saving is picking up. And if we're able to sustain this level of savings, we should be able to get to levels where we can build enough capital across Nigeria, Zambia, Ghana, Kenya, I, I think it's happening. It's happening. It's just a matter of time. Okay. Thank you so much. And I think um, for us in the diaspora, we just want the comfort. You know, what are some of the things that you know people need to pay attention to when they're making a decision? Um, you know, for a type of an investment to go for. You know, how do you know which investments actually go for? I think from the point of view of uh, diaspora and where you live outside the continent and you want to do something on the continent or invest in something since you are not here to run it yeah. but first of all you need to set your priorities right what what is your objective for investing do you want to invest for the future or you want to invest to create some level of revenue to fund a certain portion of your current expenditure so you need to very clear in your mind what is the purpose for which you want to invest. The, 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 the next thing I would advise is that you need to set a very clear time frame. What is the time frame that I want to run this investment for? For most of us in Africa and the diaspora, I think most of us want to save to try and build some level of income to support us where we don't have the ability to work and generate income. So I think for the diasporians, I'm, I'm sure most of them will have will have a time horizon a bit in the long term to try and generate some income. And that's another thing you also need to look at is where whether you have liquidity needs now or you don't have short-term liquidity needs. For, for mo most of the people get into investment. And by the time they start investing, they realize that they have a payment to make, a child going to college, mortgage, mortgage payments coming up. Meanwhile, they've tied the money in investment and they need to go and liquidate. And you know the issues around liquidating when you've not met your time horizon target. So you need to look at that aspect as well. And another thing you also need to look at the fact that how what's your capacity to absorb risk? That's something that I think. It's a very important condition you have when you want to invest. In Access Bank, when you have a discussion with your personal banker, several questions should be asked to determine your tolerance for risk. For instance, we will ask you, do you are you prepared to absorb some risk if your investment lose, loses value? Some one well, will say, I don't want to have anything to do with losing value. So we'll say, you know what? Stock market is not for you because stock market high risk, high return, you can lose value. Then and I would say, I just want to have regular streams of income and preserve what, what, what capital I invested. We will move you towards 
the bonds, the treasury bills, the, the fixed deposits, where you are assured of regular receipts of coupons, interest, and also you have some level of protection on your capital. So you need to look at all this, and when you are done analyzing all this in your head or talking to your investment advice, I'm sure the securities will, will be very available to provide you such advice. We also have our personal bankers who will have a chat with you to try and gauge what risk you can absorb based on your current situation. With, 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 with all this coming through, you will be able to determine what kind of investment will suit your purpose. Looking at your circumstance, looking at your risk and return criteria, and looking at even what your short term liquidity, what your short term needs for cash is, we, we, we will come up with something that will be able to meet your needs. So I think you need to look at all these factors before you settle on any investment that you want to make on the continent. Bear in mind that since you are not here on the continent, you will rely on advisors to support you in this. So you need, we need to have that frank discussions and open up to whoever is interviewing us or is trying to get to a certain level of understanding of our situation. So when you open up, it's easier for the person to prescribe a certain level of investment for you that will suit your, 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 your situation. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I think I'm going to bring on all the panelists now so that we can get the conversation going. I'm going to bring back Akosi, Yofi and Emmanuel. Um, thank you all for being patient and, you know, letting everybody um, come and, you know, introduce themselves and, and, you know, now we can get the conversation going. So what are some of the available investment opportunities in Ghana for people in the diaspora currently? Now go with my boss, Yofi. Like currently, you know, if somebody's in the UK or USA that are watching, what are some of the investment opportunities that we can invest in? You know, it's a very interesting question because uh, I say Ghana is uniquely endowed. Um, so there's just so much opportunity so much opportunity everywhere that you see. And um, of course, we are sort of at the lower end of our development as that yet, and we are yet to grow. Um, and we need to understand the history of that, that at some time after our independence, almost all development and almost all business in the country was centralized in government. And so we have a pretty young private sector, but we have a tremendous opportunity um, in, internally and outside. Uh, Ghana is resource rich. I mean, we have timber, we have diamonds, we have bauxite, we have manganese, we have iron ore, we have rubber, we have limestone, we have oil, we have salt, we have gold. And as well, we've been exporting all these resources in the raw form. So, of course, I mean, if we want to escalate into the higher value chain, it means that they will need to add value and process some of these uh, minerals. And the president. Um, our, our president, uh, with great vision, has directioned Ghana beyond aid, where we are saying that, well, we are not more going to accept handouts and gifts and be at the beck and call of our benefactors. But what we'll do is we'll use our own resources in partnership and linkages with the global economy to grow. That sets a very good ideological you know, foundation for we beginning to take advantage of our resources, etc. So for somebody in the diaspora, all these are opportunities. And it's just not these. But um, it's, it's just not these. Sorry. Uh, um, sorry, that's my point. It's just not these. Uh, we also believe that some of these would then create other opportunities which um, people in the diaspora can take advantage of. Um, and so finance is one. Access to finance, um, services. Um, uh, looking at services, you can uh, bring a whole lot of services back to um, uh, the country on the back of some of these minerals and resources that we have. There's hospitality, um, which of course um, is a, a great opportunity to market our, our culture. Um, and, and, and it's one of the things that most visitors like to see when they enter a country, whether they're coming for business or coming for pleasure, they want to understand the, the country. So our food, our, our clothing, our fabric, all these are opportunities that 
somebody from the diaspora should um, you know look at as an investment opportunity. And at GIPC, sometimes I, I really, you know, shudder when I, I see there's a lot of foreigners coming and asking questions, but you don't get the same questions from Ghanaians and Ghanaians in diaspora. You know, you have people coming from all over the world, from Asia, from America, from Europe, from Latin America, from Africa, coming in mm -hmm. and asking, okay, how can I do this? How can I get involved with this? Where would I find capital? Would I find banking services? Uh, would I find schools for my kids? Would I find a good home to live in? Would I find good hospitals? And all these are opportunities, you know. Uh, but for the longest time, because of statism at the beginning of our, our independent time, we've always felt like, no, it was a government that should provide everything. But now the, the government, the current government, has clearly stated that the private sector should be the lead in our development. And therefore, creating the opportunity such that the private sector can take advantage of, 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 of that whole um, demand um, in the market to invest. And so these are a myriad of opportunities that I believe um, uh, present an opportunity for people in the, in the diaspora. I mean, um, in, in 2018, for example, Ghana was ranked the 10th as the world's highest school producer, and second in Africa, and now the first largest producer in Africa, um, ahead of South Africa. Um, but if you look at the gold industry in Ghana, or the gold yes, industry as it is in Ghana, um, mm. it's mainly been funded by foreign direct investments. And it's now that we're getting a lot of Ghanaians getting interested in it through artisanal uh, mining, etc. Um, we've had to also go the problem of um, Galamse, which is illegal mining, um, as our interest has increased. And government is, is doing all it can to um, curtail illegal mining and formalize artisanal mining, such that it becomes a great opportunity even for Ghanaians. We have bauxite. We have over 900 million metric tons of bauxite in the ground, which is yet to be fully exploited. Um, in fact, we are the eighth highest um, endowed bauxite resource nation in the world. We also have, and, and you know what bauxite is used for? It's used for aluminum. And so yeah. the opportunity to convert the bauxite to um, alumina and then to aluminum still exists as an opportunity, a significant opportunity. Then, of course, we have manganese. Ghana is a major exporter of um, uh, manganese. And in Suta alone, um, actually produces about 2% of the world's manganese uh, supply. But manganese is important for um, if you want to do um, steel. And as we have large resources of iron, iron ore, um, it means that uh, we can actually manufacture steel here. So it's another opportunity for us. And then, of course, we have salt. Salt uh, is a major resource that most people don't talk about. We only talk about the other minerals, the mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, forest minerals, etc. But Ghana has over 3 million tons of salt deposits available for commercial salt uh, production. But we only produce about 350,000 tons annually, um, making us one of the two biggest regional players in salt production. But Ghana alone can supply all the salt requirements of Nigeria, which has a huge demand, uh, not to mention the other countries in, in the world. And then, of course, um, we all know that Ghana is an oil producing country and is a new um, kid on the block uh, so far as oil is concerned. And oil was discovered in 2007 and first produced um, or poured in 2011. Um, as before, before COVID-19, um, we were doing about 200,000 barrels per day. Um, and new, new investments and new finds uh, give us a potential of rising to over 500,000 barrels per day. Uh, and, 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 and so, you know, I, I believe that opportunity is there. But it's just not that. Sometimes it's not just the investment that um, uh, the Ghanaian, the diaspora has to make, but the value which they can actually come invest in the market through expertise, through experience in other markets are also very critical for us in building the economy. And, and so I, I keep saying that Ghana is a blessed country with immeasurable resources that will create opportunity for everybody. And in today's Ghana, you would real, you'd, you'd find out, I mean, the observation you make very keenly is that we are also going through our own market disruptions where people are now using technology um, to facilitate their, you know, uh, marketing behavior. So a lot of people 
are buying on, on, on the net, are buying using the um, mobile money, are buying using um, service providers who only take the orders on the internet and deliver for you. I mean, I, I, I was very surprised today that I was trying to organize something for a good friend of mine. And I didn't have to step out of anywhere. Right on my phone, I put out a request. And I had supplies for everything I needed. And I just gave him the orders. It says, okay, just deliver. And, and, and that was done. Uh, and so, and, and if you look at the, 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 the fintech and the technology space, you find a lot of Ghanaian diasporans, from, uh, young Ghanaian diasporans in that space, especially in the, in the, in the supply chain business. Um, and of course, that, that in itself takes us further up the value chain of business. So I'm, I'm very delighted about that. And, and you see that a lot of the Ghanaians in the diaspora who come home, also facilitate change with their dynamism, with the new skills they've learned and all the other things that they have. Um, they bring some dynamism to the market. Um, and and it's, it's fascinating that um, the diaspora can be such a rich resources, um, which we haven't used um, in the past, but now we are. In fact, indeed, um, GIPC is setting up a diaspora investment desk in the very near future. Um, that will facilitate that. And um, in, in partnership with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, in partnership with the Diaspora Office and the Presidency, in partnership with the Ministry of Trade, and in partnership with the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Business Development. And, and so we are very clear that the, the, what the, the diaspora can mean. And would you believe that it's estimated that every year um, inward remittances from Ghanaians in the diaspora um, is in the region of $3 billion? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's estimated that, I mean, with the, those that come into informal means, mm-hmm. try, could be high as $5 billion. Mm-hmm. And that is a major, major resource, uh, finance, economic and financial resource, that can go to do a lot more if it is formally channeled and utilized properly. And so, for example, the Ministry of Finance is thinking of a diaspora bond, um, knowing that we have these cash flows coming in every year, and issue a bond at the back of return, inward remittances from the diaspora, which could go into financing major infrastructure in the country. And therefore, the diaspora will play a significant part in the development um, um, in the development paradigms that we have. Okay. Lobby, can you read the question that's on the screen at the moment? Oh, there is a question on the screen. Yeah. Um, what in, is the incentive of safeguards for somebody to take dollars or pounds and invest in Ghana, given the consistent devaluation of the cities? That's always my hesitation. Yes, of course. I mean, currency depreciation is always an issue in a, an, an economy that has not um, been built for quite a while. But I, I dare say that since 2017, until the advent of, of COVID, uh, our economy was making strides and in leaps and bounds. And we are seeing the city strengthen considerably. Um, for the three years, um, 2017, 2018, 2019, average GDP was in the region of 7% making it one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Now with that, then you can have a predictable economy because price stability and predictability is very essential and very critical for having macroeconomic stability. Um, and when you have that, when you have macroeconomic stability, that's when you can talk of price stability and predictability in your market. We haven't had that for quite a while, but with the recent um, strides in the economy, we've seen some semblance of macroeconomic stability achieved. And till COVID came, Ghana was in line to be one of the fastest growing economies in the world. That's predicted by the IMF and the uh, World Bank. So, yes, I mean, it's always, um, it's always an issue, but that is there because we were mainly an import economy. And of course, we don't spend dollars here. And since we're importing everything, then people have to change cities into dollars to import, bring the goods here, add their markup, uh, make their profit and sell. And that in itself brought volatility in the currency. Um, if we were exporting more than we we're importing, and we export and we get a lot more dollars and cities, that would have brought great stability to our currency. Secondly, because we our economy was built on the export of raw materials and resources, we were operating at the lower end of the value chain. Hmm. For example, cocoa. Ghana has been doing cocoa forever. But have you seen one any one billionaire or millionaire for cocoa in Ghana? No, because we just export the beans. Meanwhile, if you look at uh, between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, who do about 
67% of the world's cocoa, that represents at most seven or eight billion a year. But if you look at the chocolate industry alone, it's in excess of 140 billion every year. That is not to mention cocoa liquor and what is taken out of cocoa for cosmetics and other uh, medicines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah. then we always come to move higher at the value chain. We look at this for many years. So what 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 are I mean? How does one start doing something about it? You know, because we know that we know that, you know the thing about coal and how we are not adding value to our cocoa industry. You know, how do we create billionaires from from it? You know, what is stopping us from doing that? Well, okay. I mean, I was I was talking answering to the question that I read. Mm -hmm. First of all, macroeconomic stability is essential nobody should wish that away with all the best intentions you can do everything you have but if you don't have stability and predictability in your economy you're not going to see some of the things that we think we should see that's one secondly it was easy perhaps to just export raw materials and resources um, um, from the colonial days in fact the colonial infrastructure itself was built for that to take resources out of the african continent uh, for development elsewhere and we are saying, no, we need to change that. So it's not something that we, we suddenly could have just gotten up one day and said, okay, we stopped it, we stopped all that. Because we also import stuff, and we need to run an economy. So the balance of it is that we are moving away from the lower end of the value chain to the higher end of the value chain by adding value to our raw materials and resources and exporting them. By doing so, we'll get higher export revenues we get more dollars than we are um, using to import. And that will bring about stability in the exchange rate. By the way, um, Ghana City, in the first quarter of this year, was the best performing currency compared to the dollar anywhere. It had only depreciated by 2%. And even now, as we speak, it hasn't depreciated, um, if, my, if, if the figures are right, it hasn't depreciated any much more than um, it has, well, than 5%. Is that correct from the bankers? Can you confirm that? I, I know it's under under five percent. Yeah, it's under five yeah. percent for this year. Yeah, but you see, a lot of people would not agree and and, and argue. But that is the truth of it. And all these are indicators that are showing that we are having a further grip on the economy and making sure we have macroeconomic stability. When you have that, then it makes it easier for people to invest um, because then they they can actually plan ahead. And, and, and their plants uh, will be stable because the currency is stable, inflation is stable, they can price, they can do all that. So that's very important first and foremost. And it doesn't happen overnight. You have to bring in reforms in the economy, ensure that um, we, we move away from developing an economy based on debt and taxes into one of production and productivity. And that is where the direction of the economy is with some of the recent um, uh, policy initiatives like the one district one factory, which means that there will be a factory set up in each of the 260 um, districts in Ghana. Perfect opportunity for people in the diaspora. It doesn't have to be a mega factory at the size of, uh, um, uh, you know, an IKEA or something, but, you know, factories that can add value to our real, raw materials and resources and bring in um, dollar revenues or, or, you know, pound revenues or whichever it is. And that is then going to make us more comfortable, more stable to produce internally. And as I told you, we are moving away from the export of raw materials and resources into value addition because that would increase the country's revenue. And that would help us stabilize the economy as well. If you're spending well and you're planning well, which we seem to be doing. Um, and so I, I think we're on a good track and a good trajectory. Um, it's not yet perfect. And COVID has come to really uh, create disruptions. And by the way, Whilst we are seeing um, a recession in many regions of the world, um, Ghana's economy will still grow, although um, will not grow at the 6.8 projected. But uh, we, we believe that um, the advent of COVID, the growth by year end will be between 1.5% to 2.5%. Um, global economy will seem to be, uh, will, will, uh, will go to recession at minus 3.8%. Um, the sub-region will also go back by minus 3.6 percent. But Ghana would have still have a positive between 1.5 to 2.5 percent. That means we are doing something um, right and wrong. But I, for those who say that, I just saw a question which says that people in the diaspora 
do not have confidence in the Ghanaian economy and so are afraid to um, invest in the economy. There are companies that were set up in Ghana at times when we didn't have macroeconomic stability, um, but they've they've been sustained and they've grown. And I'll give you one good example. Data Bank is one. Um, Ashesi is one. Um, Soft Tribe is another. There are quite a number of them. I know a lot of young people who have come into the supply business and logistics and are doing great. So sometimes it's just not a question of, well, you know, um, we don't see confidence in the economy. It's whether you yourself have a plan that you execute and a plan that we can scrutinize and is bankable and will we'll give you money and will grow. And I think there's more than ample opportunity over there. Uh, and, and so that, that is my answer I'll give to those. It's also a, a question of confidence, you know. And um, some, there is this school of thought that says that the best businesses are those that grow in the worst of times. <laughs> and like that, some, that some, some, will tell you, some will tell you, for example, war makes great business. <laughs> True, some, absolutely. absolutely. And you have another question on the screen. Yes, it says the law is very specific that Everything must be in Ghana cities, I guess. Yes. Yeah. And mortgages are selling in dollars. Why and why is government not clamping down the issue? Actually, the, the government actually passed the law that says that we should price in cities. But, you know, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, this is a, one of these questions that uh, people always say government said this, and why isn't government clamping down? But it's we, the individuals, the private sector people who are doing all the charge, we are the ones who own homes. We are the ones who price our rents in dollars. We are the ones who price our products in dollars because, like I said, we are very in, in, import dependent. And we have to spend dollars to import. And so when we come back to ensure that we have a hedge in the pricing mechanism, we price in dollars. So if the city depreciates in the time you brought your goods in, in the time you sell, you still cover up what you spent getting those dollars. So it's 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 government frowns upon it, and government has it's it's against the law to price in dollars. But the market practice has been that everything is is in dollars, and now the, mm. the thing that most people are doing is yes, they'll give you the dollar peg and then uh, give you the CD conversion and price it in CDs, but they peg it to the dollar, you know, uh, and and that is a way to mitigate against depreciation. But if we are all to start spending CD. We were doing a production in cities. The cost in production was in cities. You'd realize that very soon, the issue of quoting in dollars does not arise. But it's because our inputs are very highly dependent on dollars, it makes it difficult uh, for people not to peg their output price um, to the dollar. And it doesn't go well for an economy, but that is what it is. And government has to work hard in ensuring that all our services, our products are priced in cities. Um, and, and it's a tough one, but it's not just, I, I think the industry associations also have a, a part to play. The regulators have a part to play, but we must all join hands as Ghanaians in and out to build the country and always stop putting the blame solely on government. We are also to blame. I mean, we, we, we go out there, we are the agents of growth, etc. We price in dollars. So, we should, as a people, um, understand the impact of that and do what we believe that government has asked us to do, price in cities, from production to sales. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can see that there's another, another question. Where is the Ghana oil growing? Uh, I, I don't know whether the oil is going anywhere. <laughs> it's still in the ground, but <laughs> that's a question. <laughs> Are Ghanaians benefiting from the oil? That's what she's written. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm going to now go on to my bankers. Um, I think it's time for us to really talk about uh, uh, the difference between bonds, treasury bills, paper assets, and index funds. Um, Apasi, please clarify the difference with all of these things. But what is the difference? Okay. Okay. Uh, so first of all, broadly, there are three main kinds of investment the first one is what we call the lending investment where you're actually lending money of a so i'll come back and then the second one is ownership investment where you actually invest in the company 
and then share in the profits. And then if it goes back to you also, uh, also have to absorb that as well. And then the other is a blend of the two. So when we come to lending investments, that's where you hear of the bills, the bonds and all that. Uh, uh, so I'll start with monies we lend to government and institutions. So when we are lending money to government, we call it a treasury. So you hear of treasury bill. So if I lend to money to government for three months, it's the ninth one day bill. And then the characteristics are predetermined from the onset. So I know the rate I'm earning. So, okay. and it's very clear for the currently it's around 13.9% currently. You could also do what we call the, the 182, a six month, you lend money to government for six months, which is 182 day bill. Or you could do that for a year, which is a 364 day bill. And the rates are all different. Uh, so as long as you lend to government, we call it a treasury. Now, you can also lend to government from two years and above, which we call then the bonds as well. We, we have the three year, five year, seven year, 10 year, and it goes on and on. And like I said, they are always predetermined, the interest rate. If it's a bond, normally they pay interest every six years, every every six months. It's a five year bond, it means every six months you get interest. And then on the fifth year, you get the last interest payment and then the whole amount. So that's when it comes to government. There are other kinds of investment, we also call them bond, which are very close to government. There's one we normally call the ESLA, uh, which Fidelity was very much involved in raising money for government to support the energy sector. And uh, these bonds uh, are backed by levies that are collected from any time we buy fuel, uh, we, 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 uh, a part is deducted as tax, which is used to support this, th th this kind of investment. So that's the bit. What's what we call the corporate bond. When you lend money to a company, uh, we call the company we put it as corporate. We call it a corporate bond. And whether it's a bill or a bond, the key thing here is that the characteristics are predetermined. You know how much you are earning, how much you are getting at the end of the period. But let me state that the person you are selling to or giving a loan to is very critical. When I give money to government, I know government collect taxes. I know government raise money government to always pay me back so it's very important when i give money to a corporate i need to understand and know that will that corporate be able to pay me back it's very critical because don't forget that you are buying into the future income of the firm yeah. if it's government you know you don't have a problem if, if it's not government and it's a company a corporate bond we call a corporate bond giving money to a company you have to be sure if we are getting the money back and you also understand what they do more often than not, I hear I hear this investment is good, and we all have this heady mentality. They come to us, it's good. We all go in there, we put money in there. It looks too good to be true. We still do it. No, what we are saying is that anytime doing a lending investment, giving money to either government or an institution, understand whether the institution has the capacity to pay your money back. Is it even doing well? You need to look at the numbers. Probably, if you can, they may have to get an advisor like me, Fidelity Securities, to help you through that process. So the bills are, like I said, one, one, uh, it's about three months to one year, T bills, and then for bonds, two years, we have a fast 15 years. So that's the treasury bill and then the treasury bonds. But then the corporate bonds are loans of you give to institutions. So that's why they are corporates. Well, the other ones which I also talk about in between, let's talk about the ownership one, which is the equity. You don't know, typically people tend to be a bit conservative. So when you talk of equities, because it goes up and down, they never complain when it goes up because the bonus. But when it goes down, then it's a problem for all of us. And th th those ones, anytime you invest in them, what you're doing is that you're underwriting the risk. You're saying that, look, I'm now owner of this business. If it makes money, I make money. If it doesn't make money, I become patient, and next time around, it will make money. And if you look at it over three to five years, it evens out, and you realize that you make so much money. So you don't panic when there are uh, there, there are some shocks on the market because you know that look, you bought into the cash flows, future cash flows of this company. You believe that this company will do well in the future, and therefore you bought into those. Uh, you bought into the future, so you know that at present it might not work, but in the future you are going to make money. There's some in between, like you said, like the mutual funds, uh, other mm. mutual funds or unit trust. The whole idea of, of these ones that you pull funds together from investors. You know, we, not everyone will have maybe $100,000, $200,000, $500,000 to invest, but I can pull from retail. I take a bit from here, 
that from there. And then what happens is that when I put it in a pot, I spread them over a lot of investments. So, so I tend to benefit from all these all kinds of investment. That's what we normally call you are diversifying, you are spreading the risks across. So for the mutual funds, the whole idea is pooling funds together from a lot of people and then investing across asset classes. For example, with Fidelity, we have one we call the fixed income. Fidelity fixed income, which invests across uh, the bonds and then the bills, so that at least you tend to benefit from all the income, of all the securities. And let me also add that, like yeah, I said, I have to I, invest in that. Typically, what's like the minimum you have to invest in one of those? I think it, it, it's a hundred CDs, which is a family dinner, if I may put it that way. If the family can just uh, say that in the whole month, probably we just go three times and not four times. We can be doing that on a monthly basis. And I think what we even help is that because it's in bits and pieces, you might not see it from the beginning. Over a long period of time, you stand to benefit. I'll share a story with you. They are saying, what do we say again? How many I'll years? What well, long period of time? How many years would you suggest? Oh, if you want to invest, how many years do you have to invest? Yeah. I ideally, it should be more than a year. Ideally, if you want to reap the benefits. But then after a year, it depends on your objective. If your idea is that I don't I want to save for a down payment for a mortgage, uh, it's a short purchase for a house, or maybe my kids' school fees, then that would be, that, 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 that would vary. But minimum is one year at least you need to save for one year so that i can reap the benefits then and then okay. let me also add that normal what you've realized that there are times this one helps i mean for fidelity we see ourselves as a financial supermarket and this, this is the beauty of it someone walks to you you have this product it, he invests in bits and pieces after that it accumulates and then he wants to take maybe a facility a mortgage he takes a mortgage and then the income from the investment is used to service the loan and and and, and the issue is that the money is growing, but then he has money now to also finance another asset. So I, I think that for me, the, the, about investment, you need to start now. Don't wait till there's a big bonus or there's a blessing from above and then things will turn around overnight. The discipline, it has to start now. Start small. And not all of us can run businesses. Not all of us, but all of us can invest. So, and I, I, I believe that it's better we start now. Let's start small. Let's man, investor, know thyself. If you know, you are not open to risk. You are not open to losing a bit of money. Start gradually. Buy these bills. Buy these bonds. I, at least you know they are predetermined from the beginning. And then as to build capacity and then the experience. Then you can start moving into ownership investment. Uh, you can start trying business. You go with businesses. You need very good partners in Ghana. Uh, because you are there and then they are here. And then at times you are not careful with the right systems in place. You might come back a bit surprised. So I think that the time to start is now in terms of the discipline there's no time to waste the time to know yourself what do you have in mind how long do you want to invest and what is your willingness or capacity to even absorb losses it's also very clear and then also we don't need so much amount to start like i said just something small and over time it will make money what you've realized that if you don't start investing now that is when when you hear of anything you may want to rush and then catch up because you're like, no, I should have started 20 years ago. I should have started 15 years ago. So now I need to make it big. And then here's something that's offering 30%, 35%. You jump in there. And like I said, if it's too good to be true, then you, you have to watch out. Always understand who you are giving your money to. Has it got the capacity to pay your money back? It's very, very vital. If you don't understand, let someone help you. So that at least you avoid all these pitfalls and not find yourself in a very, very difficult position. Absolutely. So um, does Akwasi um, uh, or Franklin, do you have anything for the diaspora, like a special bond for the diaspora? Do you have anything like that? Okay, let, let me put it this way. That, that's where our bank also can see. Like I said, our bank is a dominant player in the in the financial market space. The mm -hmm. bonds for me, the, we have a whole range of bonds. Like I said, seven year, 10 year, 15 year. And then I talked also about the SLA as well. So mine is that, look, these are offering in excess of 19 to about 23%, some of these bonds. I mean, let's knock off maybe depreciation of maybe 5 or 6%. Uh -huh. You probably be knock off inflation by 11%. And you realize that as to the youth are in excess of 5, 6%. You look at EKUS and the under 1%. So I think that it's important that COVID has told that, look, we need to build reserves. COVID has taught us that we have to build reserves. If you don't have reserves, we need a constant line of a sort from an institution. 
so that we, we don't we don't find ourselves in a very difficult situation i believe that the time to start like i said is now you can start we know ourselves i mean we're in the diaspora like i said there are these bonds available for us to invest in that is one which you earn interest every six months and you can even use as a repayment for another facility you might take in ghana or address your obligations here in ghana i think it's worth considering the other product by like i thought the mutual funds which we also do and we can bring in bits and pieces we, we aggregate it we invest for you and then over a very long period of time it, and and let me just say that times is a joy you see someone comes to invest over three five years he comes and says after six years he wants the money to start a business and there are times for emergencies and the fact that you have the skill to manage money across sectors and can even pay the person but it gives you that joy that improving lives they started very small now it's big so for me what i'll say is that let's start small that's the way but i start waiting for the time to be right and ghana to be at the stage and i can come in and invest no we have bonds you know we have euro bonds some are in dollars as well we have euro bonds as well so let's explore but let's read i mean the flate website the fso website let's read and then get home and then we can based on our risk profile we can then decide on which investments are appropriate for us Absolutely. Because do you have to be um, in Ghana to sign up for these investments? Oh, not at all. Uh, not at all. If, for example, our website at www.fidelitysecuritieslimited.com.gh, you download the investment forms, you complete, you submit, and then we we'll get a few vitals from you, and then we can start. I also advise that at least if you go to the Fidelity Bank website as well, you can open an account to buy it because we see it as a financial supermarket. You have a relationship with the bank, a relationship with the subsidiary, and then we provide to you right down from credit to investment. And it, 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 you realize that it, it takes out a burden from you and then not, doesn't put so much pressure on you. Absolutely. I'll well, come to you now, Franklin. What are some of the investment opportunities that people can take up at Access Bank? Okay, I, I think coming I mean, to taking up from where I could see ended. Access, yeah. Access Bank provides all the broad spectrum of investments available to to individuals, basically in the money market and in the bonds market. For instance, we have all the range of bonds. If you want to buy bonds, the good thing about it is that, as like I said, you don't you, you don't need to have a lot of money to buy bonds or bills. You can come in anytime you want to come in and buy bonds. The good thing is that we because we have a very diversified a huge a big portfolio you can come in and buy the bills of the secondary market you don't need to wait for government to issue treasury bills or bonds every every week before you come in even if you come in on a monday or a tuesday we can sell some of these instruments to you on the secondary market also you you the normal fixed deposit where in, in case you 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 don't want to you don't want to go for the normal traditional tenor for treasury bills so we have the 91 day the 182 day the one year and then also the bonds you can also do some some short dated term deposits we can go as low as 30 days depends on your invest your investment horizon so with with all this spectrum we are we are able to provide you some investment opportunity that will help grow your money the good thing about us is that because we we are a pan african bank and also present in some developed markets for instance our uk subsidiary we also have a branch in dubai with rep offices in hong kong china so we are we we're we, we able to support you across the, the, the globe soon you'll see us maybe in new york so we'll be able to provide you that service you'll be able to walk into a bank that you know that's african that you that you will understand you understand your needs and understand what you want to do the the, the the perfect is you go on our website, you open an account. It's, it's because we are a bank. It's easier for you to have a standing order on your account in the US, in the UK, where we give you your SSI. So as soon as you want to transfer money, you transfer it via the normal platform. Same day you get your credit to your account, and even same day you can get your investment, so that you don't have to lose interest waiting to convert the dollars to CDs to come and invest. Picking up from I think what you have said. The Ghana city has, has, has experienced a positive carry. When you say positive carry compared to depreciation, it still has excess returns. Over, over the, the, the last five years, we've seen Ghana, Ghana yields, one year yields trending between 15 and 19%, which 
is quite far in excess of what we've seen in the depreciation front, where we've seen between 8 to 12 percent per annum. So, from what they said, you, you can have about a 5 percent positive carry on the on the Ghana City investment. So, I believe that it's we, we, we have all these investment opportunities available for you, and you can also monitor your investment. One of the days whereby when you do your investment, you have to wait every quarter before you send your statement to see what you have. Now you can go on our online platforms. We have uh, our internet banking, we have our mobile banking applications, where you can monitor your investment real time, which gives you some level of additional comfort because you, 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 know, you know your investments are safe, you can monitor and see that you have a maturity today. You've been paid. It 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 it, it takes away some of the anxiety that here to used to be present in investing in Ghana in Africa, where you are not present and where you you have you have anxiety waiting to see your investment statements to check whether my investment is intact. So with all this new new tech coming up, real time access to your accounts real-time access to move money across countries, you can invest and the speed to invest is now faster. So for instance, you can move money and in a day or two, you can have your investment running for you and you can monitor it every day as and when you need to, you need to invest and where you have some needs to fund. There's also a real-time access where you can, you can disinvest, you can draw down part of the investment so, so we, we, with all these things, we provide you these opportunities and also that flexibility to manage the investments yourself if you have the experience to do it. If you don't have the experience, we can also support you with uh, personal bankers who will be at your uh, at your disposal. So I, I think I encourage all of you to yeah, look. I, I, there, there, was a, there, there was a question that said, um, if, uh, you know, how much... Uh, what's the return investment for 90 days treasury bill what, what is the return on investment for 90 days currently we it's about 13.9 percent for the 90 91 day treasury bills and it's about 14 and a half levels for the one day, one day treasury bills yeah okay and someone says what's the best way for me living in the u.s to give bonds to family and friends in ghana so the the the, the best way is if you have an account you can you if you are a ghanaian living abroad i'm sure you maybe if you have a ghanaian passport it's easier to go on our website look into our account product select a product open an account in ghana when you open an account in ghana you will be assigned a relationship manager who will contact you and give you our what we call the standard settlement instruction where you can use to move money from your base in the us to ghana and i think it's seamless same day you, you get your value so when you have that value, you can, if you have dependents, let's say you have a child, you can you, you you can open an investment account for a child, what, what we normally call the ITF in trust of if it's a child, you open the account, you can buy the bonds in the name of the child, and the, the bank will buy it in the name of the child. You have control over it. If you so if you so wish to have control over it, if you don't, since this is the child, we will we will keep the values and then when the child is of age to open your personal account, the value will pass to the child. So we, you can always get your family members to have an account with us and you can invest on their behalf. You can also invest in your own account in the name of a, a dependent in Ghana or maybe let's say a parent or anybody. Okay. The good what about, about the not Ghanaian, Franklin? What about the not Ghanaian and they have family and friends in Ghana? they want to give bonds to so if you're if you're non ghanian you have a family or a friend in ghana just ask the person to walk into access bank open an account with the bank open what we call the csd account as the central security depository account because we are also a custodian bank we open the account and behalf of the person you move the money and then the bank will convert the funds and invest in bonds on behalf of whoever you nominate to be a beneficiary so it, 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 it's quite straightforward. Okay, okay. You have a question on, on the screen. You don't mind reading it out. To the internet and try again. Okay, I, I, I see a question which says, government works hard to take loans from international institutions. Uh, we have just mentioned the huge inflow of billions from the diaspora. What efforts are government and your institution doing to raise money from the diaspora? Um, this is Mr. Bahu, formerly of COD. Hi. Uh, it's been a while. 
Um, yes, I did earlier on speak about the diaspora bond and trying to formalize uh, inward remittances through uh, formal channels to ensure that they are used appropriately and get the right returns. I mean, ever so often we hear of people who send monies home and the monies have either been squandered or not used for the purpose, the intended purpose. And I, I think that if we're able to create formal channels, um, these monies will be probably used and used um, uh, prudently and, and will contribute to uh, economic growth. And um, the, definitely the diaspora bond, when it is floated and we are working around it, in the Ministry of Finance would be a great opportunity. But as my other friends on the show have said, you can still invest in the economy using technology through fixed income opportunities and using the stock market, for example, the stock exchange. The stock exchange in 2018 was a judge, one of the best performing um, in Africa, and uh, it still um, returns good value um, so far as the economy is good. So I, I, I believe that um, there are other opportunities which can actually um, get the um, diaspora to engage fully in the economy in Ghana. Thank you. Um, Franklin, you have a question on the screen. Yeah, I think whether our bank charges are clear and upfront and whether they just charge. I think for Access Bank, our charges are very transparent. You have our charges displayed in our branches. I think it's also a requirement by the central bank on no, all no commercial banks. So basically, before a transaction, we we, are, we make you aware of what the charge is. And if you are set to go ahead with the transaction, then the charge applies. So the charges are transparent. And normally, it's before you do a transaction. And also, it's a requirement on us by the central bank as well. Okay. What habits can people begin to adopt to effectively plan for their financial future? Okay. I think for habits that you need to adopt, I think we are all different and we all have different aspirations. But one thing that's certain that we've seen with people who have who have been successful over time in investment is discipline and also having a very clear sense of purpose what they, they, they want to achieve one one thing in this world is that no matter how small you want to start maybe a fifty dollars a hundred dollars a twenty pound you just have to be disciplined and keep at it the benefit of investment especially in the fixed income space is when you start seeing the benefit that comes from compounding what, what, what do i mean by compounding where you invest in let's say a bond, a two-year bond, you get your first six months coupon, and then you really invest the coupon. And that's that's where you see the multiply effects of investment. So you need to have the discipline, and also you, you need to have very, very, very clear goals on why you are investing. The, 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 the issues come up where your investment goals are not aligned with your capacity to and I take that investment. Let me let me share. Let, let me share so, uh, things that come up when we interact with people who want to invest. You, somebody come comes up to you and comes to a bank to maybe invest in treasury bills or fixed deposit. Basically, as a bank, we are regulated, so we give you a rate that we believe is commensurate to the risk that you are, that you 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 are taking. And then you also have a lot of investments in Ghana, which will give you very, very interesting rates. Let me say interesting rates. The, the issue come up where you, you see these customers looking for that level of rate. Maybe you want to enjoy a 20% per annum or 50% per annum, whilst we are offering you maybe a 15% or a 20%. The issue here is, it is not bad. Let, let me explain. It's not bad looking for high returns. High returns is, is not a bad thing. You can set your return target that high. But you also have to bear in mind that, that the rule of risk and return applies. So where you want a high return, you should also be prepared to take on higher risk. The probability of incurring losses or losing your investment is also very high. So you need to 
be able to to come to terms with all these things in your mind and then and then set out to on your investment journey and as i said if you are disciplined enough you should you should be able to get to a very good place at the end of the journey okay and can you see the question on the screen okay how can i buy shares on a stock exchange directly without using broker services i mean online uh, you need to open an account with with a broker normally you need to open an account with a broker you have your own investor id and then you can start trading you cannot move money to an account and then just start trading so it's important that you you register you have an account with a broker and then you can take it from there and don't forget with money laundry issues and all that we need to know exactly who is actually investing here and there so you need to have an account with the broker have an account even. Okay, Emmanuel, you were talking earlier about investment in a commercial property. Can you speak more about this and how people can invest? And so, so uh, specifically, we are trying, like I said earlier, we want to buy a community centre worth two million pound. Uh, the whole idea is to raise as much deposit for the building. The more deposits you can raise, the lesser the mortgage you're going to take, which means the less interest you're going to take, make uh, to the bank in the long term. Uh, mm -hmm. It simply means that we are selling shares in a company called Ghanaian Community Property Services. Uh, mm -hmm. And a share is selling at £10,000. Uh, ideally, a £2 million building with a 30% deposit is about 600000 So far, we have raised about 300000 So we are almost there, halfway through. We mm -hmm. just need people who otherwise are looking into i know we've talked about investment in ghana shares and bonds but there are also sections of the ghanaian community either in uk diaspora or other parts of the world who are not quite ready because either they don't have somebody in ghana they can rely on they don't have anyone they can think of to manage their investment for them or whatever that can actually be here and still put some money somewhere uh, if you think of it, we buy a two million pound building this year. In the next five to ten years, by the time you actually make, I read some of the comments. Somebody said, "I want to go and live in Ghana in five years' time." By the time your five years' time come, your ten thousand pound share purchase of this uh, of this uh, share will generate enough for you to actually go and settle in Ghana at a time where mm -hmm. you'll be there to be able to take control of your own investment if this is a problem for you now. So the idea is, look, we are looking for people who have something that they can physically spare that won't cause them arm and leg because 10,000 might sound like, yeah, okay, it's a big money, but a family of five people, I mean, what, husband and wife, three kids traveling to Ghana in a summer period, by the time you go and come from Ghana, 10,000 pound share is already spent. And if you were to look at it from that investment perspective and you say, look, I've got this child, uh, it's not, I'm not ready to go to Ghana here. I'm going to buy a share, a share of this amount and put it down there, at least for the future. Uh, I think that is where we are, we are encouraging our people to go. Try and join a family, a community of people who are willing to make history in the making, right? Who are willing to be part of the history in the making. Because I believe that as history taught us, it takes a few people to commit to something that will become a story to tell one day. Uh, and part of UK story or Ghanaian community story in UK is to be able to have a place that we can call it our home, our community, where there are issues that we can meet and discuss, where we can teach our children. Uh, and, and therefore, it's important that we need to get this project going. So I'm calling on individuals who have something to spare, uh, a share price of £10,000, you will be a shareholder, you will attend shareholders meeting. These are all legally registered. We are operating under UK law, so there is no backdoor or backhandling approach to it. Everything is registered under company house and regulated by the company house you know, instrument. Uh, rules and regulations apply as per memorandum of understanding of all the shareholders. You get to choose who manage your investment uh, with the building once it's bought. And we are hoping that all this money we are turning around to other communities, it can also be part of our own community. We can then have a place where we can teach our children. We can show so many things that we are now lacking behind. And, and I call on all individuals who can actually help uh, in getting to that 600,000 mark 
whether individuals or companies or people who are friends of Ghanaian community in the UK, uh, it doesn't matter where you live. What matters is that we can all own something that we can call it a home. Fantastic. Uh, so, you know, they, they can contact you by the email that I put up. Yes. Um, and, yeah. So then, and how many shares do they get? How much percentage is the share for 10,000? Well, at the moment, uh, depending on the market rate, uh, based on the rate of dividends at the time of purchase. Now, the building, the plan is to buy the building, start running it, and then after you pay service, your building charges and your mortgage, then you know how much is left for dividends. And actually, when you think of it, your actual value is the building of the, the, the equity on the building. Uh, like I said, we have a church that bought the building of 1.6, uh, sorry, 800,000 pounds about five years ago in UK here, just around Greenwich. And that building is now worth 1.8 million in five years. That building was 800,000. So imagine if we have this building and you are able to retain your investment in it, apart from the regular dividend that you will get from the running of the place and the distribution of uh, profit after all the services are taken care of, you also have the, the, the opportunity to actually gain a lot on the value of the building uh, at the end of it all. And that is what we want people to look at the, the long-term value because if five years time you come and say look i want to uh, dispose of my share and sell it to somebody uh the value of the building is then taken and it's distributed per the number of shareholders who went in to buy the building uh obviously the mortgage people will also be involved uh, but their interest is to pay the mortgage and once you pay the mortgage they're not interested in anything else you can own the building in five years as long as you can pay the building uh, outright or in good time so we are looking okay, at people so who look at investment so on the on the building and the value itself for a minimum of five years before any uh, disposal is made okay somebody says i'm interested but i don't have um, 10k why why is it that much because the company that we registered is called special spv it's a special purpose vehicle it's one of those companies that buy and sell is for the purpose of buying selling and renting properties and it has only five uh, 50 shareholders you can only have 50 shareholders uh so what we don't want is to have people who come in with who are, who are just not ready to actually invest but just want to be hearers and listeners and not partake but if you are ready and let's say you have a five thousand pound and you want to be part of it i'm sure we can have a conversation as to how you can also become our preference is a ten thousand pound share but if there is an ordinary share of ten thousand five thousand pound there's no reason why we can't look into it what we don't want is to have 200 people everybody saying hundred thousand or um, hundred sorry thousand pound or fifty pound or here and there we want to make sure that it's a business initiative it's a profit making but at the same time the interest is towards the community good rather than uh, individual your individual aspect of making money from this in the long term is the value on the building how much you have invested and how much is valuable to you but on a day to day we want to make sure it goes towards a community interest so that is why we are key uh, in our approach that we want to make sure we attract the right investors, people who understand business and investment in that direction. Uh, because people who have bought their buildings and houses in the UK, they know that there's only so much, very little that can go wrong when it comes to a building. Uh, and that is where your safety net is. Absolutely, absolutely. Can two people come together? So maybe somebody has 5,000, some another person has five thousand. They bring it together. Is oh, that yes. possible? Yes, two people can come together. Obviously, you should know the person very well because when it comes to money, uh, along the way there are rooms for disagreements here and there when the profit is building up. But once you know somebody and you are trustworthy to each other and you want to come together, why not? We can accommodate that. Fantastic. Um, we're going to have our last 15 minutes of the show, so I'm going to run through some of the questions that we have on the screen for our panellists. Um, somebody also said, can we pay in installments? Yes. Uh, as it stands now, in the course of looking for the 600000 as I said, we've raised 300000 So it might just be that we probably go another one month, two months to go. If you want to come and join, 
uh, what we do say is by the time we are close to purchasing the building, you should have finished your installment. So your installment could be about a deposit of 2000 or 3000 and say, look, the next three, uh, one or two months, I'm going to add the rest. But you have to finish paying your part of your share by the time we enter into agreement of purchase. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I see what are the risks in take if I decide to pull my capital from the treasury bills before it matures? Okay, a treasury bill, like I said previously, is a loan you give to the government. So there's no default risk there. The only risk is what we normally call interest rate risk. What happens, I imagine I give money to government for three months. Government is working with the money. And along the line, I come up and I say, I want my money. It means that that money will have to be borrowed from somewhere else. So if, for example, as at that time, I've earned maybe, let's say, a thousand CDs. If I want my money now, if I'm paid, I may lose a bit of the thousand because the pricing goes into it. Government will have to go look for money elsewhere and pay because the agreement was for three months. So the risk is what we call uh, interest rate, which is what has to do with the price. The price will let you lose something small, small because the, the investment is for three or six months. So it might not hate you so much. So if there's a pressing need to go for the money, then of course you go for it. So there's no default risk. You are getting the money, but just that because a government has to look for money elsewhere to pay you, there's some sort of repricing, and you might lose something small on the interest if and as at that point in time. Okay, fantastic. Do does your bank give mortgage loans to Ghanaians living abroad? Oh yes, um, yes, we do give loans to uh, those who live abroad. It's something that we do. And I guess from the previous show, it was discussed as well. So as long as you have the capacity to pay, because that's the key thing, you have the capacity, you make that earnings to pay for that mortgage, there's no problem at all. So we encourage that you start doing some investments towards the, the, the down payment so that when it's due, uh, it lessens the burden a bit. Okay, somebody also said, you know, um, I... You know, I want to come to Ghana, but I'm not ready to come to Ghana in the next 10 years. What what can I invest in? Franklin. Okay, so you, you have your investments horizon is clearly spread out 10 years. So basically, if you want to preserve your principal and also you want some level of assurance on the amount of money you, 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 you can make, I think I would recommend you, you, you go for a longer dated bond let's say a 10 year bond to maturity. So well, I think currently you, you, these bonds are trading around 19% levels. So you can you can currently buy a 10 year bond that's currently around yield to maturity of 19% and you are assured of, I think the coupon is about the 19% level. So depending on how much you, how much you have, I think I would recommend going for a 10 year bond currently. Okay. Yofi, you have something on the screen. You're on mute. We can't hear you. Sorry, I was just reading out the question. Mm -hmm. My issue with the way all these resources are handled is that we lack value addition and we sell our resources at the dictates of the world market. What are educational institutions doing? Um, I, I think it goes beyond the educational institutions. It's all a question of leadership and how we've developed our economies um, to, to date. Um, and I did say earlier on that uh, the current uh, direction and disposition of this government is to ensure that we add value to our resources and participate in the higher end of the value chain. Um, I, I, I think it's it's a policy that we all are, are very keen and excited about because for once, you know, we would get value from our, our, our resources. And I explained, uh, for example, I, I said Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire uh, would do 67 of the world's cocoa, get only 8 billion a year, whereas the chocolate industry is 140 billion a year. So, I mean, clearly we want to be at that end of the value chain instead of the lower end of the value chain. But we do have the resources and government's disposition is that we are not going to export the, the raw materials and the resources as we did before. We are going to develop them here. We're going to add res uh, value here. And so if we require investment, we'll be open to partnerships that will enable us to do that. And um, that is exactly where the direction of the economy is going. Um, industrialization and, and value addition, instead of just export driven on raw materials. 
Okay, you have another question for you. Another great form. Can you explain about Ghana loans from the World Bank and the IMF? What impact do they have on the economy? Indeed, till very, very recently, we had uh, just come out of a world of, of an IMF program uh, where there was policy support um, to government. Uh, but uh, the government changed, and the new government, the current MEP government, clearly indicated that they didn't think that we needed um, um, that sort of credibility support from the IMF and the World Bank and that we were prepared to take on our own economy on our own steam um, without somebody conferring credibility on us. Um, and so that is what has gone through and um, government actually exited the program um, on completion. Um, what is happening now is that because of COVID, we have had to go back to apply for an emergency fund that the World Bank and IMF have set up specifically to address COVID issues. <clears throat> and I must um, say that I, I I don't believe that any or so far what we've seen no country in the world was ever prepared for COVID, and so every country has been rattled somewhat, and um, and and I think the African in the African context that is a bit more dire than with other economies that are stable and strong, um, and, and so many of other African countries have actually gone for some emergency relief, um, some have had their debt forgiven um, and some are renegotiating the interest um, um, obligations um, so that is what it is and, and those are, are going to support specific interventions they're not just money that um, is going to come in and government to use for recurrent expenditure and all that some of them are, are there um, like I said um, to help us uh, maintain livelihoods and some to help us maintain lives um, and, and so that's where we are but the 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 intention is not to go back to the to the IMF to get that policy, um, uh, should I say, uh, policy support. Um, the, the truth of the matter is that the, the World Bank and the IMF do not force to give countries funding. You have to apply for it. So for every country that has gone to the IMF or the World Bank, they have gone um, um, to, to those institutions as members of the bank um, uh, for support. And it, it may not necessarily be a bad thing. After all, if you put money in a bank, when you need money, that's where you go back to borrow. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it's just that um, in any country's history, um, the country wants to use its own resources to develop. And I'm very clear in my mind that the, the, the direction that the current economy has taken of Ghana beyond aid and uh, or not just accepting handouts and gifts is a good direction. Um, it has been the bane of development in Africa for quite a while, but now we are going to see Africa um, develop in a more consistent, self-driven way than it has been in the past. I'm very sure about that. Fantastic. And then another question that says, I would like to invest in infrastructure. Maybe crazy thinking, but maybe offer diaspora professionals in that field an incentive. Uh, we, 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 I, I think you are on the right trajectory because even at the GIPC, um, as we are undergoing our reforms, one of the um, one of the suggestions that we have is that um, we would um, use our incentive structures in a more constructive way, and that um, country, companies or foreign direct investors who come to Ghana and partner with local Ghanaians um, are those that would, should benefit from certain incentives. And I think that that is a, a good way to use our incentives properly because if you look. Um, annually, the amount of incentives we, we give away are in billions of dollars um, mm. to both um, Ghanaian companies and then to foreign direct investors. And so we want to do that in a more structured way. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kwasi? Hello. A question on the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you please specify documents required to, for a foreigner to open an investment account or a bank account? Well, for an investor account point of view, you know that foreigners can invest in our bonds. It's also open to foreigners as well. So the issue documentation, the profiling, the KYC, source of funds. We, we go into a bit of detail, the source of funds, and then also uh, the IDs, and then level of income. With it. So it's a bit enhanced compared to those of us who are locally here as well. 
So what I'll say is that, yes, they can invest here and then it's a very enhanced from what we normally complete for the residents here in Ghana. And then also the other key thing is the issue about the anti-money laundering. So we go a step further to ensure that at least we can verify the source of funds and it has a great problem for us as an institution or a country as a whole. Okay, you have another question. You're, you're on mute. <laughs> Because why emerging economies not taking advantage of debt relief opportunities being offered them by IMF, especially these economic turbulent terms? They are taking ad advantage of it. They are taking advantage. Some countries, the the L LDCs, as we call the least developed countries, are taking advantage of debt relief at this moment. And like I said, the the the, the problem of COVID was never anticipated, and so a lot of countries that are already in debt need debt forgiveness to be able to get back their economies on stream um, if, when we are able to overcome um, the virus. So, um, yes, it's it's true. Um, some are taking advantage of it. And some other terms are being negotiated for those who cannot be given debt forgiveness outright, especially those who are now in middle-income status and therefore uh, commercially viable um, for debt. So, but even in those cases, the interest payments are, are being frozen or deferred. Okay. And I mean, last question for you, Yofi. I know that you have to go, but I'm going to have just 10 minutes because I think there's a lot of banking uh, questions um, on the screen for our bankers, which I want to go through. But, you know, lastly, in terms of when somebody's coming to invest, do you have to register at GRPC? What is the process for that? Yes, um, uh, we. It's a, it's a very simple process. Um, in our laws, it says that all foreign investors who come to the market have to invest, uh, have to register with GIPC. Um, Ghanaians, Ghanaians may or may not, if they so require. Um, but because GIPC has the mandate and, and the power to recommend certain incentives um, and reliefs to investment, um, uh, it's advisable to register with GIPC. Uh, apart from those incentives, we also act in between the investor and the rest of government. So when investors who are registered with us have issues, we actually go in and try and resolve those issues on their behalf or bring some you know, fluidity between them and government to make sure that there is mutual benefit out of the business. So those are good enough reasons for me, for any company to, to register with GIPC. Um, because uh, we, we ask is to ensure that we bring in the needed capital to support the development of our economy. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Yofi, for joining us on the show. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. And um, Ima, yes. what, are your, what are your last words to people who are watching that, you know, are thinking or humming and hooming about, you know, investing in the property that you have um, just before you go? I would say to the viewers uh, who are listening that for us to make it together, we need to come together. If we want to go far as a community, we must go together. And uh, this is a key point for all of us, uh, all partner groups, all individuals who have interest in the Ghanaian community here, let us work together to achieve this. It is in the interest of us today and the future of our children. When you look around what is going on within the community in the UK here, knife crime, gun, the violence, even the pandemic, post-pandemic, is teaching us to think of tomorrow. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to have a place where we can call it a home, where we can bring our vulnerable groups together to at least give them a sense of belonging? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be nice to have a place where we can call home, where we can bring our politicians, our uh, policymakers from Ghana to come and account to us because anytime we have to do this the, it comes down to cost and as a result of it we those with the diaspora here we feel left out I think having a community center is going to be something that we need to uh, make it happen for the good of ourselves as a community and our people it is a 10,000 pound uh, preferential share and a 5,000 pound uh, ordinary share 
Uh, I hope as many people after this show who want to see the future in investment. If you are looking to buy a building one day, your own property one day, but you are not ready now, maybe this could be an opportunity for you to put some money somewhere where in five years' time you can release the, you know, your investment towards your, you know, your other, other courses. And I, I will be much more happy to help anybody who wants to come on board uh, if it means guiding them through. I'm calling on churches, I'm calling on benevolent organizations, focus groups, interest groups, uh, individuals uh, to come together so that we can get this done once and for all. Let's not wait for government. I, I believe in government, but I also believe in our own selves. We live in the diaspora. We need to be able to be strong. And one of the things that brought all this to me is when we hear our groups meeting at places that belong to other people, but we never stop to question ourselves. Why can't it belong to us? Yeah. And this is where we are at the peak of our, of, our, of our community discourse. And I think this is the time we need to get this done. And I, I invite all to join. No, you've done amazing well. To raise 300,000 pounds, you know, um, in the diaspora is, is, a, is a real good stepping stone. And so we hope that, you know, people that are watching, if you're really, really interested, I will put Emmanuel's details back on the screen um, so you can get in touch and see how you can invest. Again, like you mentioned, that, you know, you can come in partnerships as long as you trust that person, because obviously money is a, is an, it can be an issue. Um, so you have to make sure that there's trust within yourselves um, and you can come together as a group and invest that £10,000 and get some shares and equity in, and stake in the in the company. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a business, so you are going to be making money. That's the whole purpose of it. Um, it's not just going to be a community centre, but a way for you to make money from it. And I think that's what's really, really important. Um, so, Emmanuel, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank, thank you. you for doing such an amazing work in the community. Um, as a chairman of Ghana Union, and you raise awareness of everything in the community, anything that's happening, um, and we really appreciate your support that you give us as a union. Um, and so I will again direct people to the website um, to learn more about what you do and how they can get involved. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Thank you so much, Lenta. Thank you. Okay, so back to my, my bankers. We're gonna rush through some quick questions because there are a few questions for you. Um, so is it possible for overseas finance companies to partner with banks in Ghana to provide loans and mortgages? This could help with interest rates to local businesses. Anyone? I, I think it's done. You know, normally, if, if you watch most of the, some of the banks, in our case, you have lines with some of these institutions, European Investment Bank and then other financiers, and they give long-term loans because if don't forget that when you take mortgages, it's for 15 years. So a bank will need some financing that it can pay over 15 years so that at least you can match the assets and then their liabilities their taken. So I think that these partnerships are there, but the, uh, the more we have these partners, the more it becomes easier for people to access mortgages. Then it becomes very cheaper for us to fi finance some of these mortgages. So I think that they are there, but from outside, the advantage is that they tend to be long-term in nature, some 10 years, some 15 years. That allows us, as a bank, we get this funding. Then we can also give out and people can pay over that period. So it helps in, in matching our assets and our liabilities. So they are done. Okay. It, it does happen, yeah. Okay, is that the same for you, Franklin? Yeah, I think, as I could, as you said, we, we, we as a bank, also have some funds with from some offshore counterparts to provide long-term funding. And the good thing is that those funds normally typically come at lower interest rate because of the environment. So it's something that we do, and also we're able to pass on the reduced cost to the, the, the person taking a mortgage in Ghana. So I think it's something that we we'll welcome, and we, we can open up discussion and talk to these people and see how whether we can push this thing further. Okay. I think this parent's question has already been answered. You have to open the bank account, right? Adu Yes, that, that's right. And then they also go to our website, uh, Fidelity Securities, www.fidelitysecurityslimited.com.gh. Download the, 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 the forms for the products, complete, and then scan and then send it to us. And then we'll complete by getting your ID and then other documentation and then start investing. But additionally, it will be good to also open a bank account. That helps in facilitating the process of investing money for you. Okay. And also I put... Um 
I could see his email address on the screen as well. Franklin, if you don't mind typing on our private chat your email address so I can put it on the screen as well. Um, is there, yeah, is something for this scope to invest in other properties and not and not just any any, any particular one? And people invest in uh, properties. Yeah, I think the structure. There are different structures. Um, for example. Currently in our industry, in the asset manager investment industry, uh, they are developing what we normally call real estate investment trust, whereby they can mobilize funds from all of us and then invest in properties. We are hoping that in the next three or four months, it can be rolled out and then no matter the amount of money I have, I can still be part of that cake. Because let's not forget that now people are even wondering, is it worth what kind of property? Is it residential? Is it commercial? Is it mixed with COVID? Especially now that we cannot all work in the office. Some may have to work from home. So I, I think that for the ordinary investor, there's a vehicle coming up whereby they can all pull funds together and then they will look at investing in, in, either in a mixed use, whether it's residential or maybe uh, commercial. But if not, then maybe probably those with a lot of money can do direct investment. You buy property and then you make rental income from them. So the options are there. But I think that we are in the era of trying to diversify risk. So anytime there's an opportunity and there's this product on the market whereby they pull funds together and then invest in properties, rather join in that because then the risk is quite spread. Now you buying one property and then when is not taking up and they've got to be service that facility and you're not getting income, it becomes a challenge for you. So mm -hmm. we'll be updating investors once these products are out, they will let them know and then they can also be part of it. Fantastic. Um, um, Franklin, what is an investment portfolio and why is it important? Okay, an, an investment portfolio basically is a basket of investments where you have different asset classes in one in one basket and you you tend to invest in it basically for individual investors right it's difficult to achieve what we call diversification whereby you can invest in several securities or in several segments to try and manage your risk because you you have limited amount of funds and you cannot for instance you want to get some exposure to let's say the mining sector right so you 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 might you might want to invest in let's say Newmont Ghana. However, there are, there, are, there are other factors that affect Newmont Ghana that might not affect, let's say, a go field. So you need to have a portfolio whereby you can have different securities and also sometimes across asset classes. The, the, the beauty about having investing in a portfolio is that it creates diversification at a lower cost. And also you have your transaction cost going down. For instance, you, you, you can invest in a portfolio of assets that mimic a particular segment of the economy. In that case, the, the creator of the portfolio, let's say the investor, the fund manager or the investment manager will invest in several companies into a basket and you can you can invest a unit in the unit of that investment. That gives you that diversification and owning several asset classes with a small amount of money rather than you trying to diversify on your own and trying to own every type of asset class in that portfolio. In that case, you might need a very deep pocket to do that. And you also need, you might need some level of skill and expertise that might not be available to you being an individual investor. So with a portfolio, you're able to gain exposure to certain asset classes, certain economic segments, and even certain companies at a lower cost and also with, with, with a reasonable amount of money rather, rather than trying to own every other stock in that, in that basket yourself. Okay, fantastic. Um, Akwasi, what do you think are some of the bad money habits preventing people from achieving their financial goals? I, I think the first one is the fact that there's not a clear difference between our needs and our wants. It's, it's a big problem. We need to, we have, it has to be very clear, our needs and our wants. If we're all over the place, that becomes an issue. We'll always be procrastinating. The time is coming, I'll get a big amount of money and then invest. So that's the first thing. There has to be that clear segregation between your needs and your wants. What is really essential for you to survive? And what are the, desire, the things you desire? So it has to be very clear. So that at least you can cut down the things that you know 
they do, you don't really need them but if you are not there nothing really happens to you so that at least you can invest that's one and not budgeting especially when you don't budget you always do impulse buy buying anything you see you want to buy so not budgeting is also where you have to be able to plan and then budget it's very very critical the other one is that i want quick returns quick quick so you hear you don't even understand what you're entering into i hear it's good i hear it's paying so much if you don't understand the characteristics of the investment please do not make any, any attempt to invest thinking that it will happen by chance and get your money back so i think that having knowledge is also key that we understand we just don't go in it just because it makes money and the other thing is that let's know that for every investment there are returns and there are risks they are just a return and risk are not bad fellows the more returns you want the more risk you should be prepared to take so i think that those are the few things that i'll share and then also not 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 postponing and then starting now the time to start is now not waiting to start start bits and pieces year in year out the monies you add they are compounding you are making more money interest on interest interest on principal and over over some number of years you also start to gain and then also being focused have a plan in mind what what are you thinking of is it a purchase of a house is it your child education is it to fund a holiday in future is it to enhance your retirement needs is it to be some spending habits in the future it has to be very clear like we have companies as an individual also have your own balance sheets what are the things i own what are the things i i owe where are the gaps how do i close those gaps they are very very important so that at least at any point in time when issues like this happen like COVID coming in at least you can weather the storm Mm. But uh, uh, see, how do you calculate, you know, your net worth? How do you know your net worth? Oh, okay. So basically, let, 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 let's just do that. Let, so you look at what are the assets? What are the things you, you, you own? Your house, your car. So the fiscal ones. So start with the fiscal ones. I mean, the house, the car, the land. And put value to them. You have an idea of the value. Put some mm -hmm. value to them. That's one. And then also, if you have some financial assets, maybe a treasurable here, a bond here. And then let's add them together. So after mm -hmm. doing the addition... That what do we owe? So are we taking loans, whether why uh, credit cards, overdrafts here and there? And let's take the difference. If it's negative, then there's an issue. Then, then we there's an emergency. As as much as possible, we should find a way of closing that gap by yeah, looking at other income sources or investing more, so that at least we can we can close that gap. So that's why it's vital that we are very much particular about the investment we enter into. Because if these assets mm. lose value and then there are liabilities to pay, realize that the gap keeps increasing. And then if your your net worth is negative, then there's, there's a problem. Over time, you realize that you may, it might create very difficult problems for you. So it's important that you can be doing that maybe annually, just to be sure where you are, whether your assets are appreciating. If you, so that at least, and then we look at liabilities and it's positive, it's a good sign. If it's negative, then you've got take a second look at it and then start investing to close the gap. Okay. Um, Franklin, do you come to your, does Access Bank offer financial literacy classes for Ghanaians to learn how to invest? Yes, yes. We, 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 we have a series of webinars that we organize that, that basically bring together specific group of individuals to try and bring resource people that can provide training on it, may offer some advice that suits the their Peculiar need. One of one of one, one of those webinars is what I think is, is very acclaimed is the is the W webinar series where which is very which is tailored for women. So we bring resource persons who are business women themselves and trying to run business on their own to try and provide advice to women on 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 providing on investing in in Ghana and also investing in other sectors of the country. We bring what we call the ambassadors who are basically very well known achievers in Ghana who come and share their experience because it's very difficult to try and get this these achievers one-on-one -on -one to share their stories with you directly. I will try and bring them to this forum to try and provide that kind of specialized advice and also help you men mentor some of them to be able to be savvy investors. So I think we will we will, we will share some of those webinar webinar details with you and then also you can blast it to your business who can join in some of our webinars. 
Absolutely. Um, I think the last question would be, you know, what are some of the key things investors have to check to ensure they are dealing with the right regulated organization to avoid the fall of any Ponzi scheme? Okay. So I think that first of all, the first is that is the institution I'm dealing with, if it's a financial institution, are they duly regulated by either Bank of Ghana or the Securities and Exchange Commission. You can check out on the website whether they are regulated. That's one. Secondly, the product I'm investing in, is it also regulated? Has it been signed off that they can actually invest in that product? Because as long as they are not invested, then at times it takes a long time for you to recover your money back. So the key thing is that is the institution regulated? The product they are offering, are, they, are the product also regulated? That's one. And then thirdly, the person I'm, or the institution I'm investing in, like I said, do they have the capacity to pay the money back? Have you looked at their numbers? How have they been fine three years ago? And going forward, how are their plans like? Do you think they have the capacity to make earnings that will ensure that they pay your money back? Which is also, I think, very, very extremely vital. And try it to your own objectives. It's very important uh, because don't do what everyone is doing. What are your objectives and uh, the time you want to, and then also look at your time horizon. How long do you want to invest your money as well? And does it fix your old risk profile, your ability to withstand losses here and there? So you look at all, you know, and then also one thing that happens is that normally when we invest money, there's one key thing we tend to ignore, which is uh, liquidity. Mm -hmm. The investment I'm making if I want to exit for one reason or the other, is it possible for me to exit? With the risk is not a big thing. I'm sure you've heard about people trying to recover their money and it's becoming a problem. So understand the kind of investment you're undertaking. And then ensure there's also some sort of exit route. If one reason or the other, you want to exit, you can exit and then get your money back. Finally, Franklin, why is it important for people to build multiple streams of income? I think the current pandemic, you know, all, of the, all of us are, are, now, are now trying to find our lives and trying to find ourselves within that space has brought to the fore the fact that you, you need some level of backup, some level of, some level of support and alternative income that can provide a balance between yeah. your, your your day job and what you what you are you really need to to run your life for well, I'll, I'll, I'll say this the the risk or the or the issues that my employment or my employer is faced with is is basically something that you have little control of for instance, we, we woke up one day and then we, we, we realized that there was something creeping up in China in, the last, in December. We, we thought we understood it. Fast forward January, February, March. And I'm sure most of us have seen the tall list of companies that are folding up, filing for bankruptcy. God forbid that you find yourself in such a company and you don't have a backup. So you need to have that other stream of income which will provide that balancing act so in case your main your your main daily bread goes down you will have something to fall back on pending when you're able to find your feet back into your mainstream employment so in this current environment i think if we, if we did not see the importance of it i think in, in post covid i'm not sure anybody needs to have a discussion with you whether you need a second stream or not because the way the world is changing and it's changing very fast mm. you can wake up tomorrow without a, without a roof over your head and without that other source you will you will, you will, you will hit rock it's true well i just want to say thank you so much for joining us on the show i don't know if there's any last words from both of you before you go um but thank you so much for enlightening us on you know the opportunities i think that you know um like you said, it's. I think it's good for us to be having multiple, you know, um, streams of income because we don't know what's going to happen. Um, and like you said, you can you can invest as little as a hundred Ghana cities, 
you know, that shouldn't really break the bank. Um, and I think it's also important that you touched on the mutual um, um, bonds as well. Um, so again, in the UK, I think Franklin is the one that um, mentioned about the kids one that you have. In the UK, they have that. Usually what happened or before, what happened was the government would give you like maybe £250 um, into the fund, the mutual fund, and then you top up each and every month. Um, and so I think it's a great initiative that, you know, um, you guys are doing. Do you have the same thing, um, Fidelity, Abuzi? Yeah, we, we have we have the, the, the one. Uh, we have two of them. One invest in fixed income and the other one adds a bit of equity, especially that one for the kids for towards their future. But unfortunately, we don't have government topping up, but at least you can start. Maybe some <laughs> conversation. <laughs> I mean, even the UK government has actually stopped it now. They used to. Um, they stopped it now. But yeah, it was probably <laughs> that. Perfect. And but we have it. It's good for the kids, for their future. You can start now in the, in the next 10, 15 years. It will be nice. Yeah, and it's good capping. So you're not allowed to cap it for the 18, right? Is it the same? Which one? You don't touch the money. You can't touch the money until the child is 18. Is that the same? No, no, no. no. It's up to you. If you want to take it, it's flexible. Now, if you want to oh, take okay. the money, you can. Yeah. The okay. flexibility okay. is there. Yeah, if you want okay. to take it. Okay. We allow that for that flexibility. Okay, fantastic. So, any last words, um, um, Franklin, before you go? I think for for for, for Access Bank and for, and for me, I think one one advice I will give or everyone in that's probably when you are investing is I always I always like the definition of an asset from the accounting perspective. Well, I think it's a bit technical, but I'll give it. It, 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 it goes like an asset is a resource that you control as a result of a past transaction that you will have future benefit flowing from it. So the, the key word is future benefit flowing from it. So anything that you are investing in that you are calling an asset, that will, that is not going to give you any future benefit. You should have a second look at it. Some mm -hmm. asset that you might you might think you are investing in will rather take money from you periodically to service that asset. And in, in that instance, you have what you call a liability, not an asset. So as you are investing, always have this at the back of your mind that an asset is only an asset if it generates future economic benefit to you. Anything that you call an asset that doesn't generate that benefit, I think you should be looking at other things as well. So for, from us, we, 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 we hope that as we begin our investment journey, most of us would minimize the mistakes and hopefully you will achieve your 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 aim at the end of the tunnel we will share i think there was a question on our uk address so i, so I think we, we will share with the entire and the entire will share with the, the audience I will definitely. thank you so much franklin for spending so um two and a half hours with us of good talk and education i think we've been very well educated when it comes to investing in Ghana. Thank you so much. Okay, and I could see your last few words for us. Well, I think that from the Fidelity Group, both the bank and Fidelity Squeeties, I just want to assure people that with us, you are safe, your money is safe and will build value for you. We have the expertise, the experience, and most of our uh, directors have worked in other markets and they bring that experience to bear as well. And also, very strong systems in terms of IT, which will help us engage you digitally, especially those in the diaspora. So for me, I think that we can start that journey of value creation with you today. And then you smile five years time and say, well, it's good I had a good partner like Fidelity. And you can look back and then be happy that you made the right decision. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for this opportunity as well. Thank you so much, Dr. thank you. Okay, guys, I hope that you have enjoyed the show. Give me a thumbs up if you have enjoyed the show and this amazing topic of educating you on, you know, investing. I think it's so important that, you know, sometimes we think, oh, five years is going to take a long time for it to mature. But look at how the year is just going so quickly. Five years will come so quick that you wouldn't realize that Even when I say, when I look at my children, I'm thinking, oh my God, I can't believe he's 12 already. You know, I can't believe he's eight already. The years go so fast. Just invest, close your eyes, let it mature, and then reap 
the benefit of it. So I think it's so important. Now is the time for all of us to be investing in Ghana. And I think that, you know, there's great opportunity. You can you can invest as so little, such a small amount. Um, and I think that we need to be doing this. In the UK, come on, you can do £20, £30, invest it in something, just close your eyes to it and let it mature and see what you will benefit from it. Um, I do a mutual fund for my kids in the UK, you know, and I, and I think I'm going to do another one for them here, you know, and make sure that, you know, I'm growing. And then, you know, Franklin mentioned about assets. What is your asset? Um, and I think it's been such a great topic today. Um, let's invest let's invest and the time is now and i keep telling you guys the whole conversation since the covid um dental show live started is about the time is now and i think the time is really and truly now um julian thank you so much for watching savvy Safo. um oh my uncle Safo, who's watching all the way from saudi arabia is late there but he decided to watch um, and you also got his children to watch as well because he thought that it's very, very important for us to be investing back home in Ghana. Um, and so again, before I leave, I want to make sure that I told you and I keep, we'll keep telling you that you need to get your Seek headphones from um, Seek VR. Um, like I said before, let me get her details up. You can get 10% off this amazing headphone. Um, and it's made by Ghanaian and we need to be supporting each other. So I think it's really important that we do that. And again, to, you know, our main sponsors, um, World Remit for, you know, sponsoring us. Um, join, you know, 5.7 million people who send money um, on their platform. Um, and it, I think, you know, with World Remit is the only way to go. OK, um, they are fast. They are efficient. Um, and the, low, the, the fees are very, very low. Um, all you can do is go on their website and their app is available 24 hours and you can easily send money back home. So make sure you go online, download the app and get going. Guys, thank you, thank you so much once again for joining in on The Dentist Show. Again, if you are looking for investment opportunities um, in Ghana um, and in Africa, you also can go to Odana Connect. I'm just going to put the details up. Um, register at Odana Connect. And, you know, that's a platform that we're going to have that if you want to partner with somebody in Ghana, Africa, if you want property investment, um, real estate, whatever it is, agriculture, it is going to be the platform that you can use. So again, guys, thank you so much for watching the show. I will see you um, on Sunday. Sunday, we're going to do the men's version of... Um, the women's conversation that we had about societal pressures of, um, of being an African woman, uh, we're going to have it with the men and see whether the men get the same, uh, you know, harassment of getting married and, you know, their career choices, etc. And I will see you on Sunday at 6.30. I'm going to have Reggie Rockstone or Chami Kwame, um, you name it, to really speak about the topic. Do men face the same challenges as women in terms of having children, um, you know, getting the right uh, profession, etc. Well, guys, I call it Social Sundays now, so make sure that you join me on Sunday at 6.30 Ghana time, 7.30 UK time. All right, I'm going to leave you now. I'm definitely going to leave you now. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.